What's up, everybody? Welcome to the House of Mario, the award-winning Nintendo podcast backed by 120 Power Star rating. And the doors to episode 119 are open. I'm your host, Drew Agnew, and joining me, as always, is my best friend, the wonderful, succulent, furthy drinking Bryce Wit. How are you going, mate? Good. Now that this is our third attempt starting again. Yeah, so we're a bit rusty. We've been away for two weeks. Yeah. And we will explain. It's not exactly our fault. Yeah. It's not really anyone's fault, but yeah, we'll, we'll get into that a it's little bit later. It's technology's fault. Technology. It's technology's fault. Uh, technology does not like us. No. Except it, for when it works. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've had we've had that many hiccups with technology in the last two months. Yeah. No, there's two of them. <laughs> well, yeah, but like two huge. It's enough. It's enough, yeah. Like, you know, we've been doing it for three years and prior to these two it's only happened once yeah that's that's a fair bit mm. yeah yeah a bit unfortunate but uh, I guess just to start off with the house bulletin board uh, this is a very important uh, thing I want to bring up Bryce so our friend Dylan Blight from the Explosion Network he uh, tweeted at the house of Mario he said so he took a picture of a can of Furphy and he uh, said 7 out of 10 it's fine stuff but not blowing my mind would drink again so he said would drink again. So that's a that's a good start. Good he enjoyed the nice refreshing ale mm-hmm. that our little creatures uh, incorporated <laughs> offer over there. <laughs> oh, beautiful! Yes. Uh, plug plug. Um, where's hint, where's hint. where's the sponsorship? Uh, little yeah, creatures. That's how it works, isn't it? Mm. You you talk about something on a podcast and then it just ends up in your lap. Mm. Yeah, like fairly old parents, but with microphones. Oh, well, that'd be cool. Mm. Yeah. So what what could you say? You could say like, I want a a muffin. And just appears. Oh, it'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Just for speaking into a microphone. Mm. Imagine if things were that magic. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Anyway, it is it is interesting that we uh, that Dylan has now tried the Furphy. So congratulations, Dylan, on your Furphy drinking. <laughs> it's, look, it's it's just it's just uh, you know it's a crowning achievement in your life. Oh, it is. The, the only really thing is. is the only thing is is you've drunk it the wrong way, my friend. You drink it from a keg. Because that's the best place. That's the best way to have it. Mm, mm. Without it, without it, seven out of ten for a can. Yeah, I can understand that. That's good. That's yeah. good. That, that's yeah. all right because it's a canned furphy, and canned beer in general, in my opinion, is not great. So that says something. Uh, but try it from a keg. Do it. Find a pub. Find Do a it. pub. Do it. Yeah. And I would crack the can, but we've already cracked the cans on our first attempt at doing this podcast. Yeah. Exactly. And we had to stop because Bryce made a funny. <laughs> Uh, line and I started choking on my beer then I started sneezing because it was in my nose yeah, so yeah it, was, it was quite an entertaining thing shouldn't, I'm surprised we didn't keep it but <laughs> shouldn't have told you that because now it's like Drew you're a, you're a bit of a goose it's alright it's all right, I'll tell you what he'll uh, he'll uh, replicate it at the end of this podcast alright mm. like oh no I have beer up my nose there you go haha <laughs> 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 um, also on, on a serious note, congratulations to everyone at the Explosion Network. Uh, yeah. They got uh, quoted in PlayStation Australia's sort of uh, review trailer for Concrete Genie. Mm-hmm. They got titled, they got their review score 10 out of 10 top, uh, featured in their trailer. So yeah, congratulations. Fantastic, to the, guys. That's yeah. awesome. That is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, Congratulations absolutely. to everyone at the Explosion Network. If you're interested in Concrete Genie, go and check out his re- Dylan's review. Yeah. I really enjoy because it's a game that I was uh, quite interested on PlayStation. Oh, it looks really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of cracking furfies, uh, next episode should be available on Patreon next week sometime. So, uh, yeah. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah, because every time we've tried to record cracking furfies in the last couple of months, something's always gone wrong. Mm. Yeah. We are hoping to record it after this, but uh, we'll see how we go. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah it's, yeah, it's getting pretty late. We'll see how we go. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you this question again, Bryce. Uh, would you rather be trapped in an ele- elevator full of men with BO or three soaked dogs? Three soaked dogs. Three soaked dogs. Three awesome. soaked dogs was my answer. The thing is, is humans smell disgusting. It is. Absolutely. Like once you get a bit of BO on there, yeah, it's not great. Just think about what dogs do though. Like, you know, all all their poo they do, all of the uh, sniffing of bottoms they do. You know, it's just, uh, it's pretty vile stuff. I love dogs, but they're... 
they're they're a silly little uh, animal, really. Yeah, but I mean, when they get wet, they just smell like wet dog. They all smell mm. like the universal same thing. They don't smell like five different types of bo mm. because they don't sweat. So really, it's not that bad. <laughs> they pant. Well, they the yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah. They pant. So you don't have a problem there. Isn't they don't, there, don't you find it a bit ridiculous how uh, they've got to lap their water? They can't just like suck it up. Yeah, I guess so. It'd be so inconvenient. Oh, I I completely agree. It'd be awful. Have you ever tried to lap soup before? Uh, no. Well, there you go. Have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a funny comparison. So there you go. Yeah, it was a very funny comparison. Oh yeah. So Bryce, uh, you've been playing uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and I know this isn't Nintendo, but Bryce is a big Call of Duty fan, yeah. a big fan of the, especially the Modern Warfare over uh, the years. sect of games. That's right. So I guess, uh, what are your impressions on release day of? the game uh yeah well so i played it at pax i lined up for like an hour and a half to give it a crack because i uh didn't play the beta um and i was impressed with it uh infinity ward as a company for developing cod games has been sour for the last what was it two times now that they've made a game yeah uh that's not modern warfare and that was ghosts and advanced warfare no infinite infinite warfare yeah and um, they were both flops. Uh, Ghosts tried to capitalize on the popularity of one of the main characters from Modern Warfare 2 and sort of what that character represents uh, and didn't work. So, yeah, there's that. And then um, that was also a launch title, I think. Uh, Ghost was. Yeah. Yeah. That was also a launch title uh, for this generation, which Mm. is now coming to an end. So... You know, they've gone from the first to the last Call of Duty of the generation, and the last Call of Duty might be their only good one. So, yeah, let's let's see us hoping. And then, uh, obviously, uh, Infinite Warfare really tried to basically do Black Ops 3, but not successfully. So, yeah, there's that. But played it, uh, played it at PAX. I was very impressed, and I was like, okay, I'll uh, pick it up. Uh, I, I want to play it for the campaign anyway because it's got Captain Price in it. Captain Price is an amazing character. I've lived with him through three games of horrible torture and sadness. So, <laughs> I picked it up. So, is is this the same Captain Price? The same cat? Oh, no. Uh, or, technically, it's rebooted. Yeah, so, it's rebooted. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. But apparently, the campaign's really good. Um, I haven't uh, really stuck my nose in it yet. But the things I'm hearing are good good things mm. they had that uh, no Russian mission from Modern Warfare 2 that was like a huge controversy yeah apparently the like it's got moments in that where it's sort of like not quite that level but quite up there in like the uh, I suppose the grossness of war seems like they're trying to push the limits of uh, what they can sort of display in well, the medium yeah. of video games yeah. to, to be fair war's a gruesome thing oh, and yeah. like I mean it should be it shouldn't just be like oh no another Call of Duty game bang bang kill everyone cool that was fun yeah it shouldn't be like that no you know <laughs> yeah no that's the thing is that um, it's it's a gruesome thing and Modern Warfare's always done a pretty decent job of sort of displaying how terrible war can be yeah Um. so I haven't played the campaign yet, but I've been playing the multiplayer. Uh, it was a bit of a pain in the ass today because I bought it on PC and because Battle.net uses always online architecture because everything that Blizzard does is an online game. Mm. Uh, it means I couldn't play anything while the servers were constantly crashing from all the logins. And because it's cross-server now uh, between Xbox, PlayStation and PC, everybody's jumping on the same server at once. So, it didn't work for about the first hour and a half, which sucked. I was sitting there hitting the login button for ages. No, oh, man. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it was no good. But it's just uh, online games in general, sort of, these days. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a shame, but, no. Oh well. Um, I did eventually get in, and I've been playing it, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. it it's got a new physics engine, so it kind of feels almost like half between Battlefield and COD. Mm. And it's sort of a nice mixture because it does sort of take away the arcadiness that COD's always sort of had ingrained in itself. They've always, like, it's always sort of told well in the story that, you know, it's war, war changes everything. <laughs> but you, you never really felt like war changed anything when you could run around and do a 360 
no scope and <laughs> you know all that shit. That, be, yeah. That's not a part of war, but uh, it does it does feel um, more weighty in a sense of like uh, the movements not as quick and juxtaposed or you know when you're sprinting you've got two different sprint speeds and you can only maintain the top one if you're not exhausted but you can still keep jogging afterwards and stuff like that it just it overall it feels like um like it's sort of ramping up to a battlefield type of thing yeah um which is good because battlefield and its physics engine it was always a good thing like the the series might be in hot water right now but that's also EA's fault um but COD fills that gap nicely. Uh, the maps are still relatively small. They have some big ones prepared for Ground War, which is... Yeah, so how much time have you played with the multiplayer? Uh, how much did I play today? Probably about four, three, four hours. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I've still got a fair bit to go, obviously. The gunsmith's really good. There's a lot of options there if you want to make a class. And Yeah. And did you see like many um, PlayStation Xbox players pop up in your lobbies and things like that no because unless um unless you're actually partnered with somebody from another console you won't get them or okay. unless yep. unless there's like absolutely uh nobody playing on pc for example then you will not get paired up with one right. they will always prioritize your controller method first which is how they determine everything yeah okay they determine it by controller method so you could be using a PlayStation controller. It's like, oh, well, there you go. That guy's PlayStation, so they'll put it up. Or if they're using a mouse and keyboard, they're going, oh, that guy's a PC player, so they'll pair it up like that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but, yeah, unless unless it's completely dead, uh, you're always going to get PC players or, you know, you're always going to get PS4 players or Xbox players. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think you've got to use your Activision ID. Uh and then add each other through the game to sort of yeah hook yep. up and you know connect with each other but that's the same for Fortnite and its systems as well yeah it's pretty standard practice across these cross saves you need some yep. way to be able to connect yeah that's yeah. it so um yeah I mean I'll, I'll I'll do it I'll do it eventually yeah but uh yeah they were, they were, they're just scrolling through the reddit a lot of people sort of come into matches where PC players were playing with their PS4 friends and stuff yeah hmm yeah, having you talking about it, I'm like, oh, if I can find it for like 64 bucks, like, like you know, I guess relatively cheap, I'm like, yeah, I think I will get it and see if anyone else wants to play. And yeah. being cross, cross-play, cross like people, whether on Xbox or PC, I'll be able to play with them. Well, that's it. Yeah. Cross-platform is the biggest thing for it. And it's the first Call of Duty that's doing it. So it's uh, because of the way it's set out, they all the DLC needs to be free and all that stuff. So they've done all that. There'll be a battle pass introduced to sort of make up for that. And as they have told us, no loot boxes, but I'm not sure how much I'll hold them to that. Depends on Activision. <laughs> yeah. But I don't feel like Activision needs another controversy on their ass right now between what's going on with uh, Blizzard, you know, which is obviously one of their subsidiary company companies. Mm. And that's where their game is. It's on Blizzard's launcher. So I feel like they'll probably try to reserve rights and maybe not do anything about cash loot boxes at least for well, six months it sounds like they've got their battle um, pass sort of a, a way of getting revenue so I don't think they're going to be trying too much to add too much more to it but you never know I don't think so either I yeah. mean I mean, the thing is is there is a cosmetic store there if you want to buy things to be honest there's not really much purpose in a first person game you're not going to find a hell of a lot of use for it yeah um, but the battle pass is fine. I can deal with battle pass. Uh, you know, ninety days. You pay ten bucks, fifteen bucks, or whatever for ninety days, and you unlock some stuff through that. It's like great. I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. At least I can go. Do I want this one? No, no, I don't. And then I'll move mm. on. I reckon they're actually a bit of fun. Actually, yeah. battle passes. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Like it's a sense of progression that is sort of tacked on and keeps you playing, mm. and it's good. Yeah, like Even- I, I, I sort of brought it up. You know, like this is a full price game, and having it just. Uh, I guess your progression and behind a paywall. I know there's like a free version as well for the um, battle pass, but it's like oh, we're already getting uh, you know eighty bucks or whatever you buy it off the PlayStation Network or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and now you want more money just to like unlock more stuff, but you mm. are getting those map packs for free and everything. So yeah, 
Well, they have to have them for free. Uh, that's why the exclusivity yeah. deal happened with PlayStation for the survival mode because they were like, well, you can't have the map packs one month early anymore because it's, you know, yeah. cross-play. So, bad luck. And then they're <laughs> like, well, we still need something out of this deal. Activision. <laughs> and then they were like, okay, fine. We'll give you a free game mode. And to be honest, like, as much as I'm kind of like, man, that's shitty... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I think I'm fine with what I'm dealing with at the moment. I've yeah. got other games I could play a horde mode on, and they're probably 100% better than I could think of, you know, just Spec Ops yeah. Survival. We had that in Modern Warfare 3 how many years ago, and it was pretty average stuff. <laughs> Go and play that one if you want to. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So I guess I'm uh, moving on. Um, at PAX, I bought a Switch Lite. You did. And i sort of been thinking about it, and I'm like... <laughs> the things I've said about it on this show, no, I still stand by it. Uh, still too expensive. I bought it at PAX because it was thirty dollars off. It was down to like two ninety nine, and that is the price where I'm like, yeah, that's a that's okay, that's a fine yeah. price for it. You know, it is a switch. Yeah. And like, um, the main reason I sort of wanted to buy one because uh, away for the weekend, want a new toy. It's a bit cheaper at PAX. You're all hyped up. Yay! I tried it at the Nintendo booth. I'm like, oh, I really like this. I love handhelds. I want the yellow one. Went and bought it. Like, just a very, very much an impulse buy. And playing it here at home, I'm just like, absolute. Like, it just feels so nice to play. Um, I love the D-pad. The first thing when I picked it up at the Nintendo booth was to see if that D-pad had the same problems the uh, Pro Controller has, where you can sort of rock it from side to side with the up and down uh, buttons, I guess. And it doesn't have that problem, thank God. Yeah. Because I was like, I was wondering, like, I wonder if they're using like similar technology for the D-pad. And they're not, so that's good. Because my original launch D-pad is rubbish. Um, yeah, I've said that a million times in the show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, absolutely love the um, Switch Lite. And just, I guess the form factor being so like, light and smaller, it, it, it just makes me like really hurt that you can't dock that thing. Because I would love just to... There's something that's that size. Yeah, yeah, I would just love to swap to that uh, that console. Just use yeah. that. Cause, like, I'll, not like, enough cooling in there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, obviously not. Because like, the big switch does get very hot. Yeah, 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 for sure. But like, even with the screen being like an inch smaller, like it doesn't feel that much smaller when you're actually playing it. No, yeah. No. And like at PAX, I was getting around with my switch light in my pocket, and like I didn't have the biggest pockets. You know, I've got I had like quite tight pants on, so I didn't have like you know big baggy shorts, and I could just like put anything in there. So I was quite surprised I could actually get it in my pocket. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Mm. No. It was a decent purchase. Yeah. Chucked it when you got it, like 30 minutes yeah, after you got I, it. I dropped it in its case, so, you know, no problems there, but it was a bit silly. I was, I was telling Bryce how, like, oh, this case is slippery. Ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, they just fucking drop it on the ground, like, <laughs> yeah. My God. The, the, the uh, dilemma I do have, though, is that before I was like, oh, I want the yellow one, and had the impulse buy at PAX. I pre-ordered the Pokemon one because I like Pokemon and I like collecting <laughs> Pokemon things. I like, you know, I've got the uh, 2DS XL Pokemon ones. I like them a lot. And I was thinking, well, I'll tell you what, I will get a Switch Lite. I'll get the Pokemon one pre-ordered, put my $50 down online at EB Games. And now I'm like, oh, I wanted the yellow one, bought the yellow one. And the sort of like thing in my head was, am I going to keep the Pokemon pre-order? And I still haven't cancelled it, and I very much want it, so I don't think I will cancel it. <laughs> um, so, and that's the thing. Like in the past, when we we're talking about Switch Lite, I said, you know, just if you have a Switch, save your money, spend them all on, on all the games coming out this year, because there's a lot of games. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So what do I do? I buy fucking two of the consoles. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh dear. Yeah, that's your own. That's your own fault, mate. Do do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, you know what? I, I 100% agree with his previous statement. I have not bought a Switch Lite and I do not intend to and I will spend the money instead on games for my Switch. There you go. <laughs> Two sides of a coin here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So, I guess, uh, what what did you think of the Switch Lite? You got to play it for the first time at PAX as oh, well? Yeah. It's fine. It's fine? Yeah. I mean, like, at the end of the day... Um, it's pretty much what I expected to, it, it to be. It did feel better than I thought it would. Uh, but it is just a small switch. And it removes a whole hell of a lot of features that uh, 
are really handy. Mm. <laughs> like, uh, it does, yeah. especially with the reported, uh, there has been Joy-Con drifting on the light already. Um, which is not great because you can't just remove the controllers off that thing and send it back. Uh, send the controllers back. Can't do that with this thing. I am, yeah. I don't have drift, but no, I don't want to speak too too soon. No, who knows? Can't speak too no. soon. You never know. No, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, but it's not for me. Uh, and I will pass. You want the switch heavy. I do want the Switch heavy. <laughs> I want a Pro Switch. You know, I don't even care if it's a bit bulky. I want something with good power, good cooling. That would be really nice. Mm, it would be. I'll buy, I'll buy one of them as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's exactly what I want. So, Nintendo, you haven't caught me yet. You will. <laughs> you will. You will if you put out a Pro. Mm. And, I mean, I feel like you're probably going to announce that this year. Seems like the prime time to do it with the... Well, the next year, I mean. Yeah, not this year. Jesus. <laughs> no, next year. It seems like the prime time to do it around about then when they start putting out the, the big guns at the end of the year. Mm. Actually, let's let's talk about that. Uh, so, yeah, next... Uh, next generation consoles coming from Sony and Microsoft next year. Do you think Nintendo will be like, all right, we're going to go head to head with them. Here's our big powerful switch. Or do you think they'll be like, I'll tell you what, we do have this uh, more powerful switch in the works. We will not put it out against them because that is a bad idea. <laughs> they, they will absolutely not put it out at the same time. Um, but I do think they will have something to combat that end of the year. Mm. And, I, I think that is more than likely Breath of the Wild 2. Um, like, a lot of people are just like, oh, it's too early for that. And I'm like, no, it's not. And Metro Prime 4 is a long way off still. Yeah. So, what I'm thinking is that Breath of the Wild 2 will... I think... I'd love to see it come out next year. And it very well could come out next year. But I it, think it will. I think it is a little bit too optimistic to be like, all right, it's coming out next year. I do not. You don't? No. I think it will be. I don't think it will be next I, year. I think we've had this discussion before. and We, I'm we have. Sure that, I'm pretty sure the last time I said that all the assets for it are pretty much there. They are, yes. You, it's, it's a whole like, hey, Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mars type of jump. It's not going to be a huge difference. Mm. But... If you put Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask in front of someone and go, what are the similarities between these two games? People are going to be like... The green man. The, the <laughs> green man and the, and, the, and the graphics, I guess, and some of the characters in it. But other than that, like, it's a different experience. And I yeah. feel like that's exactly what Breath of the Wild yeah. 2 is going to tackle. And they aren't going to, you know cut expenditure on it they're going to want to get that out and sort of in the public's eye around about the same time because they do need something mm. I am playing a little bit of devil's advocate here because like I know that is your like, stance on, on the matter but I'm like oh maybe not next year and I think they would that is the perfect game to release with like a more powerful switch or something along those lines and I don't think that I don't think that will be next year oh, I hope it is next year I yeah but, look, I don't think the switch will be next. I don't think that'll be next mm. year. I don't think the switch pro will be next year. But I think Breath of the Wild two will absolutely be mm. there. I was thinking like maybe Mario next 3D Mario game because next year is the th- 3D Mario games are typically on the three year dev cycle. Obviously that changed between 3D Land and Odyssey because of the jump in generations between Nintendo hardware. But you know from Odyssey. Um, being in 2017 now the next Mario game three years on 2020 I think next Mario game's due and I think that will be like I don't think the next I don't think the next Mario will be as ambitious as Odyssey was Mm. I don't think it it might even be Odyssey 2 like could be yeah yeah Odyssey 2 Breath of the Wild 2 Mm. it is interesting too because as much as people love Odyssey it didn't like draw the eyes like Breath of the Wild did because Breath of the Wild really did change the way that series worked and people really drew to it and like really loved it. Oh yeah, as yeah. well. I feel like I feel like it wasn't as revolutionary as Galaxy was. No, no it wasn't though. No. Galaxy was an absolute titan for Mario uh after, you know, Sunshine even though I I love Sunshine personally. A yeah, lot of yeah. people didn't. And um for the 3D space of Mario games it was just such a unique experience whereas uh Odyssey is its own unique experience and it certainly does things in a completely different way to what other Mario titles do, but I do feel like um, 
they went against the bar a little bit of what people want. Yeah. Um, and it was the same with Breath of the Wild. People were like, oh, don't like not enough story in my Zelda game. Um, <laughs> so I don't like it. It's like, well, try and play something that's not right in your face and holds your hand. That's that's Breath of the Wild. It does a very good job of it. Um, but Mario Odyssey was sort of like we're going to give you the option of many different ways to get these moons. Yeah. Uh, but they won't be as gratifying because we don't want to kick you out of the level every time. Um, and I mean, that's great. I, I think that's awesome, but it does it does take some of the gratification out of it. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing with Mario Odyssey is it doesn't feel like when you do something good, it's grand. It feels, hey, you got it. It's like, th- thanks. I... Um... <laughs> A little bit of revisionist history, I guess, here, but I feel like I do prefer Super Mario 64, getting a star, you got it, and going back, going in, the level's a bit different, a different objective. I think I yeah. did prefer that. Oh, uh, look, hey... Like, I, I know, like, you don't have to... You can have preferences and still enjoy both. Obviously, I do, but I think I did prefer that. Um, I don't know. I would be uh, very hypocritical if I said I prefer that because uh, I play Banjo Kazooie again um, yeah, and this it's week very similar just like going it's around collecting similar. everything you and, click, collect yeah. a jiggy you don't leave the level you yeah. just move on to the next jiggy and it still feels good about getting a jiggy I just feel like they put so many moons in Odyssey that they felt less important yeah yeah. that's the biggest thing I don't even think it's like oh you got kicked out of the level to move on and like the level changes different it changes to be a bit different each time or whatever I don't even think it's it's that I just think yeah, it's just, just like so many of them you're running down the beach in one of the levels and oh there's a moon yeah. <laughs> you go and get I picked it up off the sand you yeah. pick it up like a coin like, oh. yeah. and there's obviously some that are very hard to get and hidden and all that But and there's some gratifying ones to get you know like yeah. the boss battles and stuff it's like that's oh yeah yeah of course yeah that's fine that's great but uh, yeah at the end of the day anyway we're getting off topic <laughs> we are um, well we are on topic well Breath of the Wild 2 Odyssey 2 or whatever Mario game is I think I think um, Breath of the Wild 2 will be next year I've I feel like they would not have um, put that out like they put it out as uh, in development most times when it goes such and such is now in development. It's what happened with Metroid Prime 4. They show nothing. They show a logo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this had a whole cutscene attached to it. Mm, they had stuff, yeah. And it, it was there. Like, they know what they're doing. The assets are there. They've... Uh, if anything that it looks like is to go by, they're using a lot of the old concept art. The whole reason that they're doing Breath of the Wild 2 is because they said, we have so many ideas we wanted to use and never did. So instead of making DLC for it, here's another game. Yeah. It's like, great, cool. So they've already got all these concepts they're going to use. They've got this whole premise that they're going to use. They left Ganondorf ready for this, pretty much. They're like, well, now we've got a way to use Ganondorf. Cool. Done. Yeah. Sweet. I feel like uh, maybe, say, say if it is planned to come out next year, their marketing strategy was like, show it to E3, do nothing for the rest of 2019. Uh, say show it at a direct early in the year or even wait to E3 comes out Christmas time because I won't be coming out March <laughs> for example oh no no no, no, <laughs> okay, no, no. it'll be it. coming out holiday yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but ev- even if that is their full intention you know what this team's like at Nintendo like if, if they're like oh we need more time they'll take more time absolutely yeah. yeah but I think uh, with the original development cycle of Breath of the Wild it was like that because it was new territory Oh yeah. yeah. Not because they had issues of like we can't make this game work. I mean they got Monolith in Monolith Soft to help mm. them with the map. Yeah. And stuff like that and the seamless seamless open world like they did with X and it was like beautifully executed. It's like <laughs> you know, absolutely fantastic. And I think uh I think what this what this uh sequel is supposed to Encompass is probably the things that people complained about. Um, yeah, the story. The and, story. It's going to have a heavier yeah. story and all that stuff. You know, it's going to be less focused on, you know, oh the past, mm. and it doesn't matter what the past is really. All you need to know is you need to defeat that giant overlooming sense of yeah. Because like the lead up to Breath of the Wild, it's like 
well, your link, you wake up, and there's the world. Explore yeah. it, have fun. Where this is setting up like a very in depth story with you know back, Ganondorf, yeah, and, like yeah. back lore and that, like people, yeah, really nerdy like yourself looked into. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. they're look they're looking to actually have a story with this one, and I mean that's the same sort of thing that happened with Ocarina of Time. It was like. Ocarina of Time did have story and it had like a nice world and all that stuff but then like you moved into Majora's Mask and then all of a sudden there's just flavour text everywhere mm. through every NPC every character whatever it may be um, This that's what it's going to be and I can guarantee you when Breath of the Wild and Breath of the Wild 2 are probably going to be held together like that people are going to go Breath of the Wild 2 is a better game mm. I can I can see it now I can see it happening um, but I will always hold Breath of the Wild as the game that hopefully change Zelda in, like for the better of the series for the rest of the time because as much as I like um, you know 2 days Zelda's Link's Awakening Link to the Past all that um, it's uh, I think you can sort of just leave them as be but with the, when it comes to 3 days Zelda's they needed they needed to change mm. it was getting old yeah it was getting old so I guess just to end this I really hope you're right I hope I'm but right. I'm going to play devil's advocate I'm going to say nah 2021 um, we'll we'll do a bet for a chicken schnitzel at Sharky's. Oh Christ! All right. So obviously yourself, uh, coming out twenty twenty. I think holiday. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I'll go for twenty twenty one. I think a lot of people think holiday twenty twenty. Mm. I mean, it very well could be. I don't know. <laughs> We've only seen I mean, the one long, trailer. How long did they take to develop the original Breath of the Wild? Well, they announced it uh, twenty fourteen. It was meant to come out twenty fifteen. Got delayed. Um, a couple of times and obviously it came out in uh, yeah, 2017 that, that, that was about three years yeah so th- that was because of uh, well when did um, Skull Sword it came out 2011 so it was in development for a long time Breath of the Wild mm, you know six years five six years maybe 2012 2012 2013 I don't know there's something in there anyway but uh yeah, that's completely with working the whole new groundbreaking shit. And I feel like they they have said that, um, you know, all these concepts and stuff that never made it into Breath of the Wild is what's making Breath of the Wild 2, which leads me to believe they weren't done with Breath of the Wild 1. They knew they weren't. Um, and they were like, we can't make this any bigger than it already is. So I have a feeling that they have actually been working on it longer than they say. And that it's been worked on ever since the you know at the end of development of Breath of the Wild 1 so that still leaves 2-3 years you know at this point by the time it comes around to that it'd be nearly 4 years that mm. that game would have been considered all the way up into development I think it'd be done mm. for sure they've already got everything there let's hope so I think so 2020 they got to compete they got to compete with the big big consoles Anuma what you up to mate well, and what's going to be more appealing? It's like, here's your $700 console or here's Breath of the Wild 2. It's like, if you're a Switch owner and you really love Zelda, yeah, Breath of the Wild 2 sounding pretty fucking convincing around that time of year. I mean, Bryce, let's be honest. Knack 3 is going to come out on oh, PS5. Boy. Oh, boy, Knack 3. Knack 2, baby, yeah. Donkey joke. Hooray. <laughs> anyway. So, Bryce, let's move on to our, uh, I guess, segment of our PAX episode. We did a little audio technica booth. So this is why we're two weeks late, yes. or been away for two weeks. We recorded at the Audio Technica booth with our, our good friends uh, Tom and Ash, who we actually stayed with in Melbourne yep. and uh, offered their place as a, our accommodation. So thank you very much to those two. And we also had Luke and Tam, who are part of our Discord community and also good friends of ours. And we had them on and we had a good chat about the Nintendo booth and everything and uh, the games there and the indie games and just packs in general. We had a really good time. Um, and that episode was meant to go on the Tuesday after PAX two weeks ago. But what happened is uh, we didn't receive the file from Audio Technica. Um, a few other people in our community as well didn't get theirs. We're like, okay, fair enough, you know. People are busy, whatever. And then uh, the Monday after, you know, I thought I was going to receive it, we got it. And there was a problem with the audio. The audio was only half an hour, whereas our episode was one hour. So yeah. you can see you can see the problem there. It was tarnished. Mm. Yeah. and we we couldn't I felt like I couldn't just put up the audio by itself because it's only half an episode yeah um, but I guess luckily enough we did get half an hour so we got it's not like we just missed out altogether 
So we do have uh, our the bit where we talk about the Nintendo booth. Um, we all share our opinions on all the Nintendo games there, and also like the big games like Final Fantasy, Avengers. Um, uh, you talk a bit about Call of Duty. Your hands on there again. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's back in time, Bryce. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, couple yeah. Of weeks. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, it, it it was a little bit frustrating for us because um, like that's our majority of our PAX content right there. That that, that was episode. a lot of that was a lot of our PAX content. And you know, technical difficulties do happen. It happened to us before. But I guess w- when we do it ourselves, we see straight away like, oh, there's a problem. Oh crap, we've got to readjust. Yep. But when it's already a week late, and you know it's during the week, we're busy, we can't readjust, and then that's the second week. Um, that's where the frustration came from. But Audio Technica, the guys there, Matt and everyone, was really accommodating. They tried as hard as they could to sort of get the audio out. Yeah, and they they were nice enough to say, hey, tell you what, we want to make it make up to it for you guys um we'll send you a pair of headphones each so you know, i guess you know there's that which yeah. doesn't help us for our episode or you guys to hear our coverage but uh yeah they, it's compensation of some kind they, they tried to accommodate us the, they the best they could yeah because you know shit happens but yeah and when something like ha- that happens you can't just you can't just bring it back to life mm. somehow it yeah. doesn't work like that it is frustrating too because you know um, we recorded a whole hour and a half of Cracking Furfies our last episode of Cracking Furfies that was supposed to come we recorded a whole hour <laughs> yeah. and a half of it and it was stuffed yeah you know it absolutely sucks and especially when it's in our hands and that happens it's even I would argue that it's just as bad uh, but yeah. the only problem is is that we know straight away we know straight away yeah. exactly right yeah and you can't you can't do much about it at that point you're just like I'll oh, stuff it yeah. <laughs> we we'll just have to do it. We we'll just have to do it again. But obviously, we can't just be like, "Hey guys, can you just set up another booth again so we can redo this?" And we'll pay for plane tickets no. uh, to get people flown over to PAX. And uh, yeah, well, that, that's the thing. Like, um, we got media passes, and without that episode up in a timely fashion, the people running running that would be like, "Oh, these boys didn't do anything at PAX. They didn't put any content out." Well, we did put an episode out, but. Yeah, but that was only one episode. This was the majority episode, yeah. and then you know, so there's that. There's uh, you know, you guys who may have wanted to listen to it. There's us who just like we're proud of it and wanted to put it up. Yeah. So in other words, uh, guys that are running uh, the pack stuff, so Rocket Jump, I believe we did do our content, and half of our half an hour of it is here. <laughs> <laughs> the other half is lost to the void, and we're really sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose we'll just uh, yeah. without further ado, let's go back in time to <laughs> two weeks ago when we we're at PAX on the show floor at audio at the Audio Technica booth with uh, Tom, Ash, Luke, and Tam. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the House of Mario, the award-winning Nintendo podcast backed by 120 Power Star rating. And the doors to episode 119 are open. I'm your host, Drew Agnew, and joining me, as always, is my best buddy, Bryce DeWitt over there. You're so far away. I know. I know. We're not that close anymore. We can't, like, handshake over the table. I I mean, we can try. I can't even give you a pat on the head. (laughs) (laughs) I came right around and give you a nice pat. Yeah, tradition broken. Every podcast. Yeah. I reckon this is our biggest panel yet, so I'll introduce. We got Tom. Uh, how you going, guys? We got Ash. Hey guys, how are we? We got Luke. Yeah, hello. And we got Brendan. How are we going, man? Howdy. Yeah, going well. Good, good. Uh, I jumped in a bit too early there. I'm sorry. I'll apologise. <laughs> so this episode is recorded at PAX at the Audio Technica booth. Uh, they were kind enough to let us uh, talk on their microphones, which are very nice. And I hope, uh, hope it all sounds nice for you. I'm, I'm sure it does. You can hear yourself. You I can, can hear myself. Yeah, it's exactly. Weird. It's a bit weird, isn't it? It's a little bit strange. A bit of feedback yeah. there. Yeah, don't don't log our own audio like that. So no, no, definitely not. Lazy people. Can we get a little bit less suck out of the headphones, please? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you get what you get. So I guess we'll start off with sort of uh, the PAX uh, Nintendo's booth here at the moment. Um, got lots of games there. Sort of get we got to play Pokemon, Luigi's Mansion, a few games early. There's indie games there, and there are games that are already out. Um, so I guess we'll go around sort of clockwise. Tom, what did you enjoy at Nintendo's booth this year? Uh, I reckon the the standout for me was getting to jump in, and I shared with Ash standing next to me. We co-played Luigi's Mansion. Uh, I was terrible at it. 
<laughs> Hands down, probably the worst person in the booth at that time. There were children that present as well. Oh, <laughs> you know what kids are like. They're really good. But uh, <laughs> getting to see uh, how they've implemented Guiji and the, the puzzles and the strategies and being able to play with your friends is something that I'm looking forward to. I know we've, me and Ash have talked about playing it together when it comes out, so I'm excited for that. Man. What about you, Ash? Yeah, I'm the same. Definitely that was the standout for me. I was also actually surprised by how smooth and good Overwatch looked on Switch. Mm. Yeah. Because I expected it to just be a train wreck. It was much better than I thought, and I've played a lot of Overwatch, so yeah. I'm not going to get it because I already own it on like three other consoles, yeah. but <laughs> I was... But Ash, surprised. you need it portable now. <laughs> yeah. All right. I only play my Switch docked, so... <laughs> you can cry while walking. <laughs> <laughs> As though I don't already. <laughs> well, that's the thing of Overwatch. Like, you would have to play it in your house for internet connection anyway. Yeah, I know. So the so... portability function is sort of out the window with that game. Mm. But I was genuinely surprised by how well it runs on the Switch. Yeah, so you and Bryce play a lot of Overwatch. Does the 30 frames per second sort of bother you? Are you a frames guy? I know Bryce can notice it. Yeah, I, I'm definitely a frames guy because I play it on PC and I've got an FPS counter in the top corner oh, right. of my yeah. screen when I play <laughs> yeah. it. Yep. So, so do I. 30 frames, yep. I'm normally on about 200 <laughs> on my PC. <laughs> so it's definitely noticeable. Mm. However, it's nowhere near as much of a hindrance as I thought it would be. I didn't play it, but I watched people play it and I went, I could play this easily. Mm. That's cool. Like It is good that it's on the Switch. It's, it just feels like it's a bit late and always being online kind of makes it like is this worth it for me yeah, it, something? Yeah. Yeah. it sort of defeats the main purpose of the Switch which is portability yeah. and then I've already got it on other consoles where it runs smoother at higher graphics So, mm. especially yeah. with the Switch Lite now which is yeah. a portable yeah. system yeah like it'd be good to um, it's, it's just, I reckon it's a cool novelty yeah but yeah but as you're walking around running permanent hotspot off your phone but yeah it's, yeah. it's, it's not very practical <laughs> yeah I mean you could do that there's nothing stopping you but yeah Luke, what about yourself? One thing that surprised me was actually Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of remaster of the uh, Wii game. And uh, I previously only played the GameCube one and the Engage one. And those are, you know, the first games in the series and pretty basic. But this one they added in jumping and boss battles, so it's a bit more variety than just going around a maze. Um, so I was really surprised at how good that was, so I'm going to get that. Yeah. Like, do you know if you can turn motion controls on for that game? I played it with just the stick, but I feel like it could benefit from motion controls. Yeah, I didn't actually see that, but the, I wouldn't be surprised if um, you can, because that would be a good fit. And you can do that in the 3DS one as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I did like the Wii version because I had that um, you know, launch year of the Wii and I remember just like tilting the controller. I quite liked the motion controls for that game. But uh, yeah, I felt like I felt like um, sort of in that game when you're using the stick, the whole world's moving, not just your ball. So I felt myself just like tilting my head. Yeah, because you, you control but, the world, you don't control the ball. Yeah. I, I want to see Rudism play this with an exercise ball. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be actually pretty cool. With Planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> you just mod planet Earth. Yeah. <laughs> just use the ring adventure thing they come in out with. Yeah, could do. Knock that to uh, Super Monkey Ball. And like squeeze it to jump and get a workout with Monkey Ball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, what about yourself? Well, since I don't want to mention Luigi's Mansion and Monkey Ball now, I think I need to mention the brand new game that everyone has been asking for for the Switch, which is uh, Resident Evil 5. <laughs> um, <laughs> glad you brought that up. Uh, so I played it because, of course, no cue. Uh, I walk into the booth. The yeah. guy's really surprised. He's like, oh, yeah, you want to go play The Witcher? I keep on going. I'm like, no, 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 I want to play Resident Evil 5. And he, he just gives me this look of, uh, okay, I, I'm probably <laughs> the only one that went there to play Resident Evil today. But, uh, well, I guess it's the exact same game that we've already probably played. I haven't. Yeah. Uh, did he, he pre-dust the Switch for you before you started playing well, it? It was a pro controller, and, it, and for, for being a pro controller at an event like this, it was surprisingly clean. It wasn't sweaty. Uh, it didn't yeah. exude like an odour, so I, I don't think it had been touched at all. So, yeah, it's Resident Evil 5, not much more to say, but it seems to run quite well on the Switch, but I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, do you actually want to play Resident Evil 5? I do, right. because yeah. I've actually already got the Resident Evil triple pack with 4, 5, and 6 pre-ordered on Amazon. <laughs> nice, yeah. 
But I feel like it would be a very good game in co-op, which I, th I hear is what it's designed for. So yeah, yeah. I think single player wasn't a great experience. I got to the boss fight, was playing on the most hard, difficult, um, difficult setting, and I was doing fine, sort of running away from the chainsaw guy until he decided to chainsaw the head of my partner off. So <laughs> right. that was yeah. the end of the game, game over. So yeah. I blame the computer, of course, but... Uh, yeah, I tried that demo twice and also failed both times at that chainsaw guy. Yeah. yeah. When I went in, he, he, uh, I went on on the Friday and the, the guy's like, oh, you're the first person to clear the demo. I'm like, is that because everyone else sucks or I'm the only one who's come in here? And he's like, a little bit of both. <laughs> there you go. There's probably some uh, yeah, three-year-old kid went in there, like, flicked the controller and I come in and I'm like, yeah, I'll beat it. <laughs> it was Tom. He just sucks. <laughs> I'll throw him under the bus. Jesus. <laughs> he just you didn't play, you didn't try to play Luigi's Mansion with him, all right? Oh, well, true. <laughs> he gently placed me on the bus. <laughs> well, when I play Luigi's Mansion just now, the, the guy that's standing there basically told me what to do. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's secrets in this room. Do this, do that. Oh, that sucks. Oh, they tried for me. I'm just, yeah. I'm just not great. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, I really enjoyed it. Like, oh, I wonder what's behind this wall. Did the plunger rip it off? Like, ah, there's something. I'm so smart now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, but Bryce, what about you? Ukulele in the impossible layer, I reckon. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I was sort of... A, a lot of people were sceptical to begin with, I think, with a ukulele sequel. Um, but obviously this is more in the veins of, like, Donkey Kong Country, and it plays very much the same too. It's all about, like, uh, more so returns, probably. Yeah. It's all about, like, how much speed you can put into it and, like, how well you rhythm, you, uh, rhythm your jumps and yeah. all that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, I, I reckon it's probably one of the more solid 2D platformers that we've got this year. I didn't get to play Silk Song, but it's more Hollow Knight. I don't think you can go any more wrong with Hollow Knight. And uh, I've talked about that before, so I think I'll just stick with Ukulele. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought Ukulele was really impressive as well. I wasn't expecting much from it because the previous Ukulele game got pretty bad reviews, but yeah. I tried the demo and was really happy with it. It feels very, very much like Tropical Freeze. Yes, yeah. yeah. Absolutely does. It's a pleasant surprise to see that game get such good reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after the last ukulele. It's like, I was looking forward to that. But um, it came out, it didn't come out on Switch, but it, then it came out uh, it was like April, and I was still playing Breath of the Wild. This was back in 2017, so I just like never touched it. Like, I got the, my, pr uh, I guess, a backer copy of it, but yeah, I never actually. Yeah, Yeah, because I kickstarted it for like 25 bucks or whatever. Yeah, I, I did the same, never touched it. Yeah, yeah same here. Yeah. It's pretty sad, really, but. Is what it is. I, I, I played a little bit of it on play, PS4. Yeah. And uh, I just got stuck on the main bad guy looking a lot like Gru. <laughs> <laughs> and You're not wrong. <laughs> it just stopped me. I think I remember, I watched someone play it. I didn't play it personally, but I remember the first level of it being really good and then everything after that was just not good. So yeah. they just, mm. I think they must have just, when they made it, just thrown the best level right at the start so that it felt like you're in for something good. And then you just, the rest of it's just so subpar and boring after that. Yeah. Because we, because uh, if, you, if you backed it, you got a, um, like a beta copy on a PC to try. I think, it was, I think they called it the toy box where you could just like muck around in this level. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun. Like the mechanics yeah. of the game were fun. But I think just like some bits like the casino and that, like the hub world sort of fell apart from what I can tell by other people talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other issue with it was is that when it came out on Xbox, it had serious issues when you got to the ice level. Yeah. It would have crashes and frame dips of like down to 10 frames per second, which it really shouldn't have. Yeah. It's ukulele. It's not the prettiest looking game out there, but it's serviceable. Mm. Yeah. So. Remember when it was supposed to come out on Wii U? Yes. <laughs> And yeah. they cancelled that. They're like, oh, no Wii U yeah. I think a lot of things were supposed to come out on Wii U. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I personally am still waiting for Aliens Colonial Marines. I think one day it will come oh. to Wii U. Jesus Christ. Oh, well, I think yeah, you can yeah, let that one set sail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I guess I'll, I'll be the one to bring up Pokemon because why the hell not? That's well, I figured you would. That's why I didn't bother. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so who here got to play Pokemon? Tom, you got to play. Yeah, I know right. Luke didn't. Sam nah. didn't, Bryce did. Um, so we'll go to you, Tom. What do you think of uh, Pokemon? Um, you're looking forward to it like I am. So. Yeah, uh, so the lineup for that game, we had to wait for two days. Finally, on the <laughs> third day, we got in there because we hassled the enforcer. Uh, getting into the game and being able to play it, it felt like 
it was an expansion on Let's Go, and it's going to open up, and we're going to see new things that feel. We only got to play the uh, the gym puzzle and then get into the uh, gym leader at the end. I enjoyed the the fact that they gave you your staple starters and then a couple of other Pokemon that you have seen advertised. Yeah. Uh, I was excited about being able to uh, check out Skull Bunny and Sobble, and uh, most of it was just enjoyment of seeing how they're going to move the puzzles and get you into that final boss fight with the uh, Dynamax Pokemon. But for me, yeah. that, that was that was pretty much it. Yeah, it's sort, of, it's sort of a hard game to sort of talk about because it is just Pokemon again, and the demo you don't get to use your own Pokemon or anything like that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it, it is cool just to be like, I played it before it come out. Yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Did the demo include the open area that they've been showing in trailers? No. No, no it was just, oh. it's just like the water gym. Yeah. Do a puzzle, you go and verse the gym it's, leader. The oh, open area is the bit that I would want to try out. Yeah, I thought the yeah. exact same thing. I'm actually, hearing that back, I'm actually kind of happy that I didn't wait in line for a ridiculous long time to play that demo because that was definitely the bit that I was most excited to see and play. But Ash, we got a sweet pin. Yeah, the you got me there. <laughs> did, did you all finish the demo? Because I was talking to some people and they said they ran out of time and didn't finish the last battle. It was oh, timed? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was timed. 10 minute time demo. So, like, like we've touched on previously, I'm not the brightest spark. <laughs> uh, the puzzle took me a little bit longer than the kid standing next to me. <laughs> I got to sub in my second Pokemon in the gym leader fight and then it just shut off. Mm. Really? A wave of sadness, <laughs> and then ushered out for the next person to come. That's crazy. I literally did. Maybe they just got timed. Maybe they just got frustrated watching you try to play, and they're like, "Get this guy out of here." <laughs> <laughs> oh well. At least you uh, got to play it. You got your pin. What 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 uh, starter Pokemon you choose? I I I, I picked my boy school, uh, school Bunny. Yeah. I got I got a good old Grookey. Bryce got his uh, boy Scobble. Bloody hell, they're raving over there. I do not know how well this is going to pick up in the audio, but. <laughs> I actually might go join them. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess we'll move on to sort of like any other booth. So it doesn't have. To, this doesn't even have to be a game that's on Nintendo Switch. But I, I like to just like talk about sort of the games in general at PAX. Not indie games. We'll touch that in the uh, next segment. But I guess uh, we'll start with you guys again. Uh, what was one of the, well, a few of the standout games that you played at other booths here at PAX? Ash, uh, you want to jump in first? No, you go first. Uh, the very. This is my very first pack, so I was super excited getting in the gates on uh, Friday. Uh, the very first game that grabbed my eye was uh, Lethal Lawns. So it's a four-player game. Uh, could very well be picked up by Switch. Um, but it's, it's, it's four-people rumble. You've got to try and cut your lawn, and then you have to cut down your opponents to try and grab money. I thought that was a great idea. It's fun. I think it's out on Switch now already. That is also an indie game, and we were told not to talk about them. But <laughs> I think this is a bit of a weird one to talk about, but I think a game that stood out for me was Biomutant because it was a lot worse than I thought it would be. All right. Oh, really? oh, I, I watched Tom play it. I didn't actually play it because I knew that it, that sort of game is just not really my thing anyway. But I watched him and just thought the whole time that it just looked so boring and just empty. And, yeah, I was very disappointed with that. But um, on a more positive note, <laughs> I think the, I, the game that stood out for me for being good, so very surprisingly, because I don't like Minecraft, but Minecraft Dungeons I played, and I had a load of fun. It was just fun, especially four-player co-op, just roaming a dungeon and cutting down Minecraft monsters. It was just super fun. Yeah. Good, great party game. Yeah, when they announced that game at E3, I'm like, huh, that actually looks really cool. Like, it's coming to every platform, including Switch, so... The only thing is uh, it's a free on Game Pass, so if you've got an Xbox, it's kind of like, that makes that pretty tempting just to get it on Xbox. Yeah. But it'd be great, like, sort of just, even on a Switch Lite, just in your pocket, pick it up, do some yeah. loot grinding, really? go through a dungeon, yeah. What about yourself, Luke? Uh, well, I was going to say Minecraft Dungeons, but since that's already been brought up... Oh, you bastard, Ash. <laughs> You're good at that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Darksiders Genesis, which is yeah. um, the new game in the series, which is nothing like the previous two games. It's um, a lot like Diablo, mm. which um, I played Diablo 3 earlier this year on Switch. And uh, so, yeah, anyway, Darksiders Genesis is like 
uh, I played the split screen demo and um, one difference between that and Diablo is it's actual split screen, you're not sharing the same screen. Yeah. So yeah, it's good in that way because you can split off in the dungeon a lot more because in Diablo you're stuck on the same screen and you can't get away from each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> get away from me. <laughs> and an, another difference that I thought was pretty good was uh, it feels a lot more like a twin stick shooter. You're more focused on your shooting abilities than like mm. your melee attacks. And uh, I played that for a while with a friend, and uh, yeah, that was really really fun. Yeah, I, I got to play it too, so split screen with uh, someone, and yeah, it was another uh, game that was announced at E3. I'm like, huh, yeah, that looks cool. And also coming the Switch. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to. Getting it. Do you know when it comes out? Is it out this year sometime, or is it early next year? I think it might be early next year. I think year. it's early 2020. Yeah. Probably. Sounds about right. Yeah. I, w I was pleasantly surprised about Genesis as well, because I really got into Darksiders 1 and 2, and seeing that they've changed their game style up so much to suit different ideas and different plans that's coming up, that's something that excited me as someone that's followed that franchise from the beginnings. Yeah, because it works so well, because I, I did the boss demo, I didn't do the other demo available, and I found that the boss fight was very deep, because it had yeah. a lot of different mechanics going, had particular different phases, and uh, it was very well thought out, I thought. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed, like, yeah, if you've got, like, you could charge up your gun, you could just do, like, scatter shots. Yeah. You can, um, like, just hit him with your melee weapon. You could do, like, a big spin to, like, get in there initially, then, like, beat him up as you go in. Yeah, and it's yeah. a lot about dodging, dodging attacks and that sort of thing. It's a very fast game. Yeah, the character I was playing as had this really cool electricity attack, and it got super powerful, and it, you would aim it at one person, and then the electricity would jump to all the other enemies around oh, sweet. it. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, what I did notice, I think like we had an Xbox controller, so whether it was being played on Xbox or PC, it did seem like just a bit blurry. Yeah, that's one thing yeah. I just remembered. It, the, there was something wrong with the resolution. Surely that yeah. wasn't right. Surely it was the TV. I couldn't imagine the game would be like that because it was like sub HD by the look of it. Yeah. <laughs> It would even just be the TV wasn't on game mode. I had a TV that would go very yeah. blurry if it wasn't set to game yeah. mode. And I had a look at all the TVs, they're all the same. So Maybe yeah. it was just an issue they were having. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, the game was really good anyway. Yeah, yeah. it's a game that I'm interested in, depending on when it comes out, the price, etc. Yeah. Yep. Tim, what right, I have two games to talk about. First, yeah. I'm going to have to defend Biomutant. Oh! Uh, I actually... Gone. I actually really, yeah, shots fired. I, I really enjoyed Biomutant actually because I thought there's a few different things going on. And um, like the way the demo set is set out, the first thing you do is you get to customize your rat character thing. So you choose, so you choose different. So you can decide if you want to be more intellectual based, more sort of agility, strength. So the RPG mechanics come through there, and then you can very much customize the look. And then the actual world itself looks, it, it appears interesting enough, and the gameplay was your sort of typical action RPG. So yeah. whether you like that sort of gameplay um, or not is the big question. And I guess I probably, even from the demo, haven't seen enough, I don't think. Whether yeah. it depends on how deep the gameplay of the game actually goes as to whether it can um, sort of pro, um, sustain an entire game. And uh, the second game I'm gonna talk about is solely because I waited two hours to play it this morning <laughs> is uh, Avengers on PS4. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, what would you think? I, I actually quite enjoyed it because I went in with very low expectations. I, I still think it's a massive cash-in. Uh, all the characters sort of look like faux versions of the Marvel MCU Avengers characters. So you have the not-quite Chris Evans, Captain America, yeah, yeah. not-quite Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man. But uh, from a gameplay perspective, I thought... It, it, it varied depending on what character you played. So the, the way the demo was structured is you go through with four different of the Avengers in different sections of a level. So you start with Thor, then you go you get transitioned into Iron Man, then Captain America, then Black Widow. Uh, I thought Thor played Thor played the best in my eyes. Uh, had a lot of fun mechanics, like you could throw Thor's hammer and call it back. It and, looks uh, really fun. It was Thor, a lot yeah. of fun, Thor. Uh, Iron Man wasn't as wasn't really that much fun. The, you get you start playing Iron Man and you're you're in a horizontal flying mode chasing after enemies and right. the shooting mechanics of that were just felt a bit off to me. Felt like a sort of arcade sort of um, on rail shooter, but not really done well. And then, but otherwise, Captain America and um, Black Widow, well, they play like you sort of expect. Yeah. Very sort of melee, very melee focused. Well, I guess they're all very melee focused, which I think 
might prove a bit of an issue because it does it does feel a bit like a 3D beat em up a bit, which yeah. isn't a bad thing, but it depends on I guess how deep the combat gets. Because in the I don't know what difficulty the demo was on, but I never really came close to dying. It didn't really feel difficult at all. So yeah. that's my main concern with it. Yeah, like, do you, do you feel like the characters feel like pretty distinct between them all, or? In a way, yes. So some characters have more, I guess, um, more ranged attacks. Like, well, Thor can throw his hammer, whereas mm. Captain America can throw his shield, whereas Black Widow kind of just shoots a pistol, but yeah. it yeah. doesn't doesn't have the same feel to it as when you're throwing um, Thor's hammer at something. Yeah. So I think each character is distinct enough. So I think it is the sort of game that you quickly choose your sort of three favorites because. I don't think it's clear how it's going to be structured yet, but I assume it's going to be a sort of game where you choose a couple of Avengers and you play a level through with those Avengers. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Bryce, what about you? So I played three big ones today, um, and they were Final Fantasy VII Remake, I played Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and I played Destroy All Humans. Yep. I enjoyed all three, but I'll probably give it to Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, so what I was excited about with this game is that at the end of the day, even though it's going to be episodic release and that's going to be a bit of a pain in the ass, it's going to be the best telling of that story in general. Yep. So the original game is great and it has a great story and it's known very well for a reason, but the demo that we played, like Barrett just felt more, more angry, Cloud felt more like an <laughs> edgelord. Um, the boss felt a lot more intimidating if we fought the Magitek Scorpion felt a lot more intimidating because you actually had to hide from its tail laser because that thing is like deadly. Yep. Um, and the way they've structured it is similar to, you know, 15's gameplay without the warp strike and they've uh, kept mana and ATB gauges to do your special attacks, but your basic attack is free. Um, it does feel really nice overall and I think it'd be a really great experience for anybody that hasn't played Final Fantasy VII before. Uh, it'd be a great way to get the story into you. Um, but the only thing is, is that episodic release. That's the one thing that's going to really hinder me. Um, yeah. At yeah. the end of the day, it's going to turn out to be three games instead of one, which is what the original experience was. And if you are looking for the most raw experience, I guess the original is the best way to play it because it is the original. But I guess the way they're structuring is that it's it's supposed to be not the original. It's a, it's oh, its yeah. own separate game in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. So like it's like a big action game instead yes. and it's a really good like I said it's a really good way to bring out the story because they'll be able to spread it so far yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to Midgar this time than oh, it yeah. was in the original game yeah for sure you'll be able to explore more of it I'm pretty sure it's going to be like all Midgar and then um, you know you go down to the ground level in game two and then you I guess they'll split up the continents a bit in game three until eventually you know you get to the end and spoiler redacted <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask as well, I read an article recently saying that they were bringing back turn-based combat for it as well. It was an option you can turn on. Was that there at all? Not in this demo. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I believe that is a thing where um, you can literally just have random encounter sort of thing and then do it turn-based style if you feel like doing that. But I feel like that would be a bit counterintuitive because as it is, it's fine. Like, if you're really, really gauging for that turn-based combat, then... Yeah, by all means. But if you want to experience it in a much more theatrical way and like with all the good sound design and all that stuff, it's probably going to be best in the actual action version because that's what they're spending their time on. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you're a purist on Final Fantasy and you only want what it was like back in the day, just play the original game. Don't bother with the remake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's made, it's made to be a turn-based combat game. Exactly, the original. Yeah. So if you want turn-based combat, play that one. Yeah, because this one will primarily be an action game, first and foremost, end of story. The yeah. so only problem that I sort of had with that was that I didn't really like the combat in Final Fantasy XV. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Okay, I that's, love, that's good. <laughs> listen, I, I love Final Fantasy XV. Yeah. I understand that a lot of people don't like that, but it's not... The thing with Final Fantasy XV is it was a lot about mobility, and you couldn't switch your characters, so it was a pain in the ass. But in this, they incorporated it so you could switch between Barrett and Cloud and still control them like you would in turn-based combat. It's just active combat now. So if, if, you're, if your Cloud's dead, you could switch to Barrett, give a Phoenix down, give a potion, you're done, whatever. If the boss jumps out of range, you could switch to Barrett and shoot him instead. 
So like it's into like incorporating that those sort of little things in it as well. I so. feel like without the jump strike of 15, it'll be a little less muddy too, and it's kind of like back to bare bones. Yeah. I'm Cloud, I'm going to swing my sword. I'm Barrett, I'm going to fire off a volley with my arm. Like. Yeah, it does. Because um, uh, Warp Strike was great in 15 for the world that it was presenting, but in 7 it wouldn't really work for to have a mechanic like that. So it's pretty much just, hey, up close. It's like, oh no, the boss is, the boss is going to hit me if I stand here, so you roll out and then get back into it straight away instead of tossing your sword and climbing <laughs> up a tower and then fucking, yeah, yeah. So what, what's your second game that you really enjoyed? A second one? You said you got three. So I do have three. Um, you don't have to bring them up if you don't want to. I, okay, I'm, I'm going to give a nod. <laughs> if you force him to, he will. I, I'm scared. Um, got to come to your head, mate. I will probably Britain. Probably you the lamest choice, but, it, but he actually does. I'll bring up yeah, COD. He's, he's backed in the corner, right? As much as I enjoyed uh, Destroy All Humans, it was just a remaster of Destroy All Humans. Yeah. Um, and uh, COD's sort of seeing an evolution here, and it may or may not be a positive one yet. I'm not sure, but it definitely felt more like a first-person shooter. Right. Yeah. Like in the in the same veins of like how heavy the guns feel, how good the sound design is. Um, it was really good. Um, I'm sort of out, in and out of favour of COD games as of recent, but because this is this one is a reboot of my favourite line, I might get into it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I had fun with it anyway. It was two v two. It was elimination. I got an eight kill streak. They gave me a shirt for it. I was really happy. Hey. Hey. What else do you need? You got a free T-shirt. You're free all good. T-shirt. Yep. I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so any other games you want to give honourable mentions to before we jump to the indie games? or If we're talking about getting free apparel, I got some great <laughs> Sea of Thieves stuff. I got a shirt and two pairs of socks. Oh, oh, oh well nice. Although I didn't bring that up before because that game's already out. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. Any of you guys, Tam? Nah. Um, we haven't Luke? mentioned The Witcher yet, have we? No. No, not yet. No. Well, I tried the demo of that, and I just want to say that it's uh, so impressive that it runs as good as it does on Switch. They've mm. done an amazing job on the port. Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously not running at a very high resolution, and sometimes it chugs a little bit, but it's really impressive. I, yeah. I'm not going to buy it because I already have it on um, Xbox, but yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if you're... If you, if you have a Switch and you're interested in Witcher, you should buy it. Yeah, I, th I think if you want to pl if you want Witcher portably, if you're thinking about oh you know I'll do 50% on the TV and 50% in the in handheld, I'll probably say you know, you've got to choose one because it's going to look it's, it's going to be fine on your small screen on the Switch, but I think on the TV you be like, all right, no, nah, this is a bit yeah because the demo here was handheld only. Yeah, yeah, and that's for a reason. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, sure. It's, yeah. it's a bit like looking at me from far away and then close up. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to say close up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tom, this is an audio podcast, but uh, yeah, absolutely hideous. You know? <laughs> Just joking, he's one of the most handsome men I've ever seen in my life. He's <laughs> terrible at Luigi's Mansion, though. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a uh, he's uh, the gu Gooigi to your Luigi. <laughs> he makes a great curry too, I might add. Oh my God, Bryce can attest to his curry. Oh. Oh, curry. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so we'll go, we'll go clockwise again. Indie games, what are some standouts? Well, I'm... Because <laughs> I ruined my indie first time. Uh, I'm going to give a shout-out to the guys over at the Power Hoof booth. Uh, <laughs> well, that rhymes. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. yeah. Um, these guys are from Melbourne. Um, we have recently been, been playing a game called Crawl, which we've had a lot of fun with. Uh, the Power Hoof is the demo that they're showing this year at PAX. Uh, it, it shows you as like a little, I don't know even how to describe it, like a skull with a robe. And it's just like one of those really fun side scrollers, kind of like Hollow Knight and all those kinds of games where it, it just sees you roaming through a level, hacking and slashing through your enemies. And yep. I think that looks like a lot of fun. Mm. Mm. I personally <laughs> didn't really... And we're back. Beautiful. So that's a, that's a bit of audio that uh, could be retrieved from our episode. Yeah. So um, next up, we did talk about uh, th three of the indie games I got to play and got the, got the talk to the, the developers of. Um, you didn't get to play too many games at, or indie games at PAX, did you? Uh, no. Did you play a couple? Not really. Um, there were a lot of games that I had, we, well, us collectively, had, had played over the last year. So I wasn't... Uh, 
particularly as invested this year. There was a lot of good stuff there, but at the same time, there was a lot of people there this year. Mm. Like, to be fair, like the PAX Rising sort of area of the show floor is super, super packed. And it's like you're going around it and there's all these people there and you're like, it, 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 you've got to take a day to like really check it out. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's yeah. what I did like the last day, pretty much my whole day was just checking stuff out and um, Yeah, you went for the indie games and I went for the big titles. Yeah, you're lining up for like yeah, the big the big games. Yeah, exactly um, right. Yeah, so I guess I've got three interviews to share with you guys. So the first one is a game called Snow Mercy and it's by a studio called uh, Smash Bite Games. And this is the description on the PAX Rising website. It says, uh, Snow Mercy is a competitive uh, third-person shooter strategy party game where you play as uh, one of the team of snowmen brought to life with the magic of winter. Prove to all <laughs> snowman kind that your team team's hat is is, in fact, the best in the traditional way with escalating snowball warfare. So, I actually, like, looking at this game, I'm just like, oh, it's another, like, you know, third-person sort of game. Cool. Um, but I got talking to the developer and I was looking at the uh, looking at the game and I, when I jumped on, it was actually, like, it was actually a lot of fun. Awesome. Which is which is good. That's why I'm actually bringing up here. Oh, yeah. If, if it yeah. wasn't, I'm like, ah, it sucked. No, just move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but it's a lot of fun. So, basically, uh, you start off as a snowman and... Um, you basically so you're trying to uh, take down the other team's bases so to start off with you go to the center of the map you can uh, collect snowballs take them back to your base and that's your currency to I guess buy more snowmen yep. and you can buy them with like different guns like Uzis and like, all these different things and, and I guess the, the, the idea is to sort of like stock up as many snowmen as, as you want Yep. Um, because the snowmen are very disposable of obviously the snowmen, and you can swap between them. <laughs> <laughs> you can swap between them at like all times. Yeah, yeah. And I really enjoyed the strategy, and I could see myself really getting into it. Awesome. Uh, they they said they're targeting um, early access in a year's time, so this is obviously very early in development. So that 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 makes me quite uh, quite hopeful for uh, what the game's going to turn out to be. Beautiful. So we'll jump over to the developers and uh, see what they have to say about it. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, we're here with Andreas uh, with uh, Smash Buy Tech Games. How are you going? Yeah, not bad, thanks. No worries. Uh, we're at um, your booth here for uh, Snow Mercy. Um, so I guess for, for people at home who haven't seen the game before, what's the uh, elevator pitch for it? So Snow Mercy is a third-person shooter strategy game. You play as a snowman brought to life with the magic of winter. You have these ice blocks that spawn around the level. This is your resource. Um, you can collect those and you can use them to purchase more snowmen, a team of AI controlled snowmen, and tell them what to do. You can tell them to attack, defend, or collect your resources for you. Uh, and your ultimate goal is, uh, there's, four, there's four players to each match. Uh, so each player controls a different team of snowmen. Your ultimate goal is to assault uh, the enemy forts while also defending your own. Yeah, um, I guess uh, h how many years or how long has it been in development for? So it's been in development for almost two years. Um, we've still probably got about another year to go before we hit Steam Early Access, where we'll be releasing initially. Uh, and hopefully not long after, we'll be getting on the consoles as well. Yeah. You, you, you were talking before how you're aiming for, for the consoles and all of that. And it's, it'll be an absolutely fantastic game to sort of play with your friends and sit down like... Oh, what are we playing tonight? Oh, let's chuck on some Snow Mercy and shoot each other. And what I really enjoyed about the game was um, like jumping into it. Obviously, having no idea, first time playing it, is like, I'm like, oh, you can like, you know, um, buy these different snowmen by bringing ice back to your base, and you can spend that on uh, different snowmen with different weapons. And I liked how like how I guess uh, disposable your snowmen are because they're snowmen. <laughs> And that like, you just keep making them. It's like, oh, I want one with a machine gun or a bazooka or something, and you can just swap between them uh, wherever they are on the map. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed that, and I think it's going to be um, a lot of fun just uh, with couch co-op and everything, especially uh, once you get at the consoles and all of that. Yeah. Uh, what was sort of the um, as inspiration or desire to make a game like this? Because uh, I guess it, was it because I, you know, it'd be a good uh, good way to get it out and you know a decent amount of time or. Um, not so much in the story games or what was the sort of uh, yeah, inspiration behind it so 
the game itself was inspired by a little known game for the original PlayStation called Team Buddies. Now, Team Buddies didn't do too well financially or critically, but it did develop a cult following. Uh, to give you an example, we found a secondhand copy recently on sale for $280. This is the original PlayStation game. Uh, so the people who do want that game want it very badly. Yeah, is it sort of like uh, you're going to try and tap into that market of people who want this type of game, um, you know, I guess in the modern day? Yeah, that's definitely um, a, a group we'd like to target. Uh, so as as well as the first person, sorry, third person shooting elements, um, we wanted to introduce just an extra layer of depth to the game to make the party game last a little bit longer, but also just be have that little bit more of a strategy element and thinking to the game. So um, that's why that's why you have these ice blocks to pick them up and um, yeah, and the, the ability to command the different snowmen. Yeah, because you're you're able to uh, do a command where you can make them uh, protect your fort or follow you or instantly attack the opposition and things like that and um, it, it's sort of like you've got to really like think about what you're um, doing with managing them and everything yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so sorry um, yeah that's it so um, each no man you can give commands to either individually or as a group optionally so um, I, we haven't found any one strategy that's been overly effective over another. Every strategy seems to have a counter. So some people will, you know, leave some snowmen behind to defend their base. Uh, well, they might go collect resources or um, attack an enemy fort. While others will go all in um, to take down an opponent's fort. Uh, but that leaves their base completely un unguarded. So you've got to keep an eye on where, which uh, direction the match is actually heading. Well, that's what I did. I had all my um, squad mate following me, and that was good until they all disappeared. When I was left uh, with. Uh, no one defending the fort, and that's how I my demise came. Because I, I, I had the bazooka, and I couldn't quite uh, get down the uh, other shields quite in time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess uh, you said, like we said at the start, you're sort of targeting all consoles. Um, Nintendo Switch, the the audience uh, who listens to this podcast, um, are you are you, are you um, looking forward to sort of trying to get it onto there or? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, so the Switch in particular, as soon as I, uh, as soon as we started this game, I had my sights set on the Switch. Uh, it's it's been a bit of a challenge to um, get the leads we need to to get onto the Switch. Um, but uh, where we are right now, Pax Oz, uh, I have been talking to someone uh, from Nintendo. We've had our application uh, accepted. Oh, sorry, we had our application uh, received. So hopefully that'll go well, and we'll. Uh, be looking at releasing on the Switch soon. Yeah, it'll be be awesome game for the Switch. Um, I guess uh, you can't quite do just the one Joy-Con top of the thing, obviously with a third-person shooter. But yeah, it'd be absolutely great game for that. Because um, I, I know, like when my friends come over, like the Switch is the console which we do all the party games on. Like there's heaps of like indie games here, like you know Party Crashes and that, just great for the Switch. And this is going to be another game. I can see just um, fit it, fitting in along with that, doing the sort of whether it's co-op or versing one another. Yeah. So if people want to sort of find out more about the game and all of that type of thing, um, leave us your social media and all of that. And yeah. Yeah. So um, our website, which is snowmercythegame.com, watch out for the sneaky V in there. Uh, that will get you links to everything else. Uh, but um, yeah, we're also on all of the social media uh, at. Uh, Smash by Games, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we've also got a Discord server. I, I won't try and pronounce that link here. Uh, but you can find it, a link to it on our website. Uh, oh, we've also got a Steam Coming Soon page. If you wish to list us there, um, Snow Mercy, uh, uh, that helps us out a lot and you'll know as soon as the game's ready. That's coming into early access soon or soonish or it's in there or what's the. Uh, so unfortunately we still got quite a bit of development to go. We're at least a year away from hitting Steam Early Access. That's where we'll be first. Uh, if you're super keen to try it out though, we'll be having a, um, a closed um, pre-early access testing which will be uh, soliciting help from the Discord from. So that's your place to go for the earliest possible access to the game. Yeah, so if you're interested, go and check out the Discord community and uh, help make the game into what it, the final product will be, I guess, yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining me and uh, enjoy the rest of your packs. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> and we're back. Oh, Bryce, 
What a what a great transition. <laughs> Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> uh, so next up is uh, Aluri by um, uh, Vivink uh, Studios. So I talked to Liz there, and this this was a game that really appealed to me. So this is a uh, you you'll probably recognise this when I describe it, but it's the oh I know it yeah, yeah. it's the one with the excellent art style of the uh, red panda yeah the red panda. Um, yeah, it, I was drawn to it straight away just for its um, art style being similar to like Rayman or in the Blind Forest and all of that. Except it's based around endangered animals. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, very beautiful. Yeah, and when I first, when I was playing through it, I was just like, oh yeah, obviously you're, like, you're escaping a burning forest and uh, you're leaving all these like baby animals behind. And I was actually like, just like standing next to one of the animals. I'm like, come on, come on. And I'm like looking at Liz, like the, uh, <laughs> the developer on the game. And she's like, no, I won't come with you, Mark. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Come with me. Yeah. Please don't come. And uh, t- yeah, talking to Liz, it's, uh, it was quite interesting, just all the themes and everything they're trying to push in this game. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, talking talking to her after as well, uh, I said, oh, what's your Twitter? I'll follow you on Twitter. And she, and she said, oh, this is my Twitter handle. And I'm like, oh, I'm already following you. I'm like... Why am I, why am I following? Where do I know you from then? I'm like, and she's like, oh, maybe it's one of my artworks I've done. I'm like, yes, yes. She's like, have you done any Nintendo ones? It probably would be a Nintendo one, knowing me. He's like, yeah, I did a, a Steve Irwin Pokemon one a few months ago. I'm like, yes. Yeah. So do you, do you remember that one? Yes, I do. So, so that was yeah. her who did this. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm like, awesome. Crazy. Yeah. And she does like heaps of Pokemon stuff. She's a big Pokemon fan. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, let's jump into the interview for that one. And uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm here with Liz on the show floor. Just played Ellery. How are you going? I'm going all right. Yeah. Me, oh, sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was uh, looking away when I was doing. I was looking at the game. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're the art director on this, or art? What, yeah. what? What do you call your role? I'm the solo artist. I'm yeah. also lead designer um, and yeah. studio head. I started the studio, Vivink oh, Studios. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So this game, I was drawn to it immediately, just for the art style. Um, I was talking to you, and it, it reminds me of like Rayman Origins or in the Blind Forest. It's like really nice two uh, D artwork games. Um, yeah, what what were some of sort of the inspirations for the artwork and the game itself? Well, the game itself is to promote awareness for endangered species and animal conservation. Um, that's why the main character is Red Panda. Every character in the game is based off an endangered animal that you'll be able to find in the encyclopedia as you rescue them. But Gaiampa's style, it's, uh, the gameplay, it's like largely inspired by Yoshi's Island. Um, it's a level-based game with multiple worlds that it rewards players for exploring and collecting everything and then unlocking more levels. And you go through the story and stuff like that. Um, for style, it's like a lot, I did a lot of research into Ori, like you said. Yeah. Rayman's um, Pipeline, Hollow Knight, uh, Seasons After Fall, Stuff like that, and um, but it's largely inspired by Bambi and Studio Ghibli. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. So, is there so you're trying to push the underlying message of like look after your environment and all that? Because yeah. the, the game does open up. You're a little baby fox, and you're trying to red escape panda. a red panda. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not familiar with red pandas. We got we got plenty of uh, foxes around where where we are in South Australia. But yeah, so trying trying to push the message of uh, environmental and um, yeah, so the, the game does open up with the forest on fire and the red panda is trying to escape and there was a, it, it does say like, it is trying to hit those uh, those heart strings when it actually says like, you pass little baby animals and they say, you know, not everyone can be saved. And I'm like, they're trying to like pick it up or something, take it with me. I'm like, come on, come on, but it won't come and um, towards the end of the demo, you do see it again, but it's uh, a ghostly apparition. Yeah. So, it is, so that's something you feel quite passionate about, sort of um, animals and all of that? Yeah, definitely. It's very important to keep the... Uh, you, once they're gone, they're gone forever. Yeah. Unless, of course, you use some crazy science. But, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it's uh, really important that um, the species yeah, stays alive and people are worried about that sort of stuff because then you'll, they'll never show up again like the northern... I think it was the northern white rhino or something recently, like recently went extinct. Uh, the last male d- died out and... But 
good things about, like for example, the bee, the bilby was first introduced back into New South Wales properly, like the area after it was in danger for so long and it driven out due to like rabbits and hunting and stuff like that and cats, feral cats. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's it's not all about like uh, like that. It's also about the balance of life and death, and that's why these those enemies are actually really important to the ecosystem. And stuff like that. There's just something happening that's causing them to provoke and uh, ruin the ecosystem. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, me playing this, like, I went through it and I'm like, oh yeah. But actually talking to you now, I'm actually getting. All oh, right. There's like, like a, there's like lots of little themes like going on about pushing it. And that. Yeah. Is is it to bring awareness to the red panda itself, or just uh, the environment as a whole? Well, red panda is a big one. Um, we want to do a charity stream where we're pen and network and stuff like that, uh, but it's in definitely environment as a whole. Both flora and fauna are featured in this game. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Was 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 there much research sort of done in sort of like you know doing the plants for the art and the animals all that or yeah. 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 Um, when it comes to research for the art, like I said, I researched the pipeline of Ori. We went through 3D models. We went through 3D models into 2D sprites. We went through 2D sprite art and like. Uh, also like um, Spiny-esque and this one uh, frame by frame was uh, well liked and I also really enjoy it so it was really cool um, but when it comes to well, what was the other thing you said? Oh, I can't remember now <laughs> yeah yeah, just um, about sort of the, the level design and all that itself like yeah just especially like the, with the red panda like it's just um, you know especially here in Australia it's not an animal a lot of us think about but yeah um I'm just thinking, what is—is is it just a sort of how man's had effect on the the environment, or they hunted for something? Yeah, but, it's, um, it's uh, it touches everything from for the little rabbits of like overpopulation introduced species, which is a big thing in Australia. Yeah. Um, but it's also yeah, like from deforestation, this hunt because each enemy is based off a different uh, cause and threat to conservation. Yeah. So like the big one is obviously yeah deforestation, like I said, bulldozing and. Uh, and stuff and then there's also um, there's a whole like other worlds that explore from like water yeah. things like oil spills and whatnot plastics and, um, and then there's mountainous and snow areas which is where, like drilling and uh, yeah. destruction of habitat yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely fantastic that it's touching on all, all those themes because um, it's, it's like so important because uh, you know I'm a, I live in rural South Australia and you know a lot of us over there are you know in in tune with sort of what the environment's doing because you know we need to be because it's sort of based on our livelihoods and that but yeah. um, Australian, um, environment the ecosystem environments like very very delicate yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why I like cats with well, no real land predators in Australia not like there were some but not most as many that's why cats were able to just basically take over everything yeah and same with rabbits and even horses are an issue camels yeah. too some deer are introduced and, yeah yeah. Like where we are, it's rabbits, foxes, and yeah. wild cats that are the yeah. main problem. Yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely fantastic. But yeah, it touches on these. Yeah. Two things, people yeah. don't even know that it's that uh, red pandas are endangered. And yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Like uh, yeah, I got to admit, I don't think about red pandas that much, but they're absolutely adorable, and I would hate to see them, you know, disappear. Like, because um, normal pandas, like yeah, they're obviously endangered as well. Yeah. Do they share much in common? Actually, yeah. With <laughs> pandas? <laughs> Pardon? Do red pandas share much in common with um, normal pandas? or? Um, they're more like a raccoon. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, well. well. I could have questions about um, red pandas and pandas all day. But uh, I guess if people want to find out more about the game, whether it's the website, social media and all that, where can they go to check it out? Yeah, um, you can follow my Twitter, uh, Vivink Art. Or you can go to our studio page, it's vivingstudios.com. Too easy. And uh, I have an Instagram. Uh, Instagram on alurie.art as well. Well, the Instagram being the important one, I dare say, for showing off this type of game yeah. with all the art. A lot more concept art than that. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, and, oh, and what platforms can, um, are you planning to sort of try and bring the game to? Yep. Steam and Switch. Awesome. So, um, obviously, Switch is the main one for our audience. So, yeah. Um, any sort of rough idea when the game could be coming out, or sometime next year? We'll be releasing. We'll be um, announcing our public Discord soon, and then you yeah. can join and you can look at development updates and stuff like that, and join yeah. us and discuss. Well, I'm always up, open to talk about the game. 
Yeah, and it's, it sounds like you, know, you can learn about a lot about uh, sort of the environment and all these type of thing, types of things that are being put into it as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome because yeah, I uh, had no idea if the game was about all of that until uh, until talking to you. So it's really informed me, and I hope it informs some other people listening to this as well. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. Have a good pax, and uh, I'll see you later. Whoa, what a time travel machine, Bryce. No, no. It's, the thing is, it doesn't even send, back, send you back in time. It just makes a whole bunch of weird noises. This episode should be uh, titled uh, Not Doctor Who, but Doctor Drew for all my time traveling <laughs> skills. <laughs> anyway, so the next, up, the next one up is uh, WrestleDunk Sports by Team Fractual Alligator. Uh, I got to talk to Matt there. Um, this was a game at Avcon we played. And at Avcon, and we couldn't talk about it. And we couldn't, we couldn't talk about it. I said, "Hey, hey, I don't know Matt's name, but said, hey, Matt, would you like to talk about your game on our podcast? Because it was the only game in the the indie section at Avcon that was running on Switch hardware." Yeah. And he said, "Oh, well, we actually haven't announced this game yet. We're going to announce it around PAX." I'm like, "So we we'll talk to you then." <laughs> it's like, so yeah, we'll we'll leave it till then. I'm like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> fair enough, awesome." Um, because if you if you remember, there was a a game we talked about on. <laughs> one of the pa- oh not packs episodes uh, Avcon episodes where we said oh we can't talk about this game I mean we could have talked about it but nah <laughs> save the packs <laughs> you're just not laughing to yourself anyway here is the interview with Matt so enjoy me uh, me uh, me uh. No, I don't like that one <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, we're here with Matt Trebbiani, uh, one of the developers of uh, Fragile, no, Fractual uh, Alligator. Fractual Alligator. Oh god, <laughs> on your old uh, butcher that. Hey, uh, how's your packs going so far? Yeah, really well. Uh, I think WrestleDunk really shows well at conventions like packs. It's so easy to get into and like it's easy to pick up and like it's very like fun to look at. So. Like, it's great for a convention. Everyone just comes by and has a lot of fun. Like, my previous game was pretty rough showing, so this feels really cruisy in comparison. So, uh, the game you're showing off, Russell Dunk Sports, this was a game Bryce and I got to see at Avcon, and uh, this was before you, you announced it and put it out, but we had so much fun playing. It was one of the highlights of the convention there, um, because we're big fans of Smash Bros and party games and all that, and, um, you know, Switch is one the console that I really like, just bringing around and playing, like, like fun party games on. So, uh, I guess, uh, how have you found it since the, the launch, or not the launch, but the reveal of the game? Yeah, I mean, thanks so much for playing it at AFCON as well, by the way. Um, yeah, the announcement has gone pretty well. It's such a departure from my previous work that I was always ready for, like, a couple of people that wanted me to make more narrative-focused games to be disappointed that I was making something that was, like, so mechanics-focused, no narrative at all, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, I think... For a game that I believe is quite tricky to market, um, based on like how simplistic I wanted to keep all the shapes in it to keep the hitboxes visible, um, it, it made the marketing a bit tricky. And given that, I think the announcement's gone like really well, and the response has been really positive. Excellent. I guess so. so for people that don't know what Russell Dunk Sports is, because they're not here at PAX Australia, and um, you know uh, they haven't gone to check it out yet sort of how, how would you uh, what's your pitch to people that uh, you're trying to uh, sell it to uh, so I've got like a whole bunch of different pitches some long some short so I'll just give you the basic one I guess um, it's a collection of four local and online multiplayer sports games they're all designed to be really easy to pick up uh, really quick to get into but they all have that fighting game style depth to them where as you get better and better, it should be less about like doing precise inputs and more about getting in the other person's head. Um, yeah, they're, they're designed to be like as approachable as possible to get into like the interesting part of that, which is, I think is like establishing a weird meta game with your opponents uh, as quickly as possible. So the four sports are wrestling, which is kind of like a minimalist fighting game, a bit like dive kick, but much more platformery. Um, there's volleyball, which is a bit more technical um, and involves like thinking out a play and then doing a play to counter your opponents. Um, Smash Ball is uh, about trying to sneak in a little charge of your meter uh, and not get too greedy. And it's impossible because you always get too greedy. Um, and Fencing, which is kind of like a like a more snappy, minimalist nig hog almost. Um, and that's more about... Uh, like, it's a... That's a minimalist fighting game as well, but it's more about sort of like timing and spacing. Yeah. 
I did bring up um, yeah Smash Bros before, but when, when you mentioned Nidhogg, it's like it captures like the exact same feeling I get with Nidhogg. Like I just like can't put it down. Keep them going, going, going. I, I reckon once this is like in people's homes and they have like options between like different modes. I think that's definitely uh, yeah going to be the same spirit as something like that. I guess if you if people need a comparison or something, but with uh, wrestling, that's the first one we uh, Ross and I tried, and uh, uh, no, he was beating me quite a bit. And it's kind of like what you said about getting in their head. I'm like, all right, I'm kind of like work out the timing of the slam down. Basically, like you've got to jump above them and you know do a slam down, and that squashes them, and you know that gets you a point. And I found like you know that works. When he figures out what I'm doing, and it sort of changes the tactics, and you can use like the jump ropes in different ways, and all of that, and yeah, it's an absolute blast. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. That's like exactly what we designed it for. Um, and like so, in wrestling, the main two buttons are like the slam, which kind of like dives you forward, and you can hold down to go straight down. And the other button does a spin, and that's essentially the mix-up button, and it'll just mix up your timings. Um, and I think the combination of those two creates like a very a very pure notion of what I think is exciting about fighting games without what I think is frustrating about them which is like how difficult it is to to like learn the inputs and to to get to the point where you can have like, I think because the inputs are quite difficult it's very hard to find someone that's exactly at your skill level that you can have a really satisfying like long series of games with where you get into your own get into each other's heads a lot and um, yeah it's awesome to be here because with this I wanted the inputs to be like almost too easy so that you were like right there, right at the start. Yeah, so that's really good to hear. Yeah, so like, it, like, if like four people come over and say, "Oh, let's play some Tekken," you know, it's going to take a little bit of the night to like really actually figure out what on earth yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Whereas with this, like, you know, you know what you're doing, but uh, you know, it, half an hour or so, like, you're going to be coming up with your ideas and sort of working out how to beat one another. And um, even if you do get, you know, oh, I'm sick of wrestling, I'm losing all the time. You can go over to volleyball and you might uh, be better at that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, adding in the other sports, because the games are very simple, like we we inherently can't have the depth of like uh, a normal fighting game because I don't want to have that many like moves and that much to learn. Um, and that's where I think the the other sports parts of it come into it, where I want just a bunch of experiences that are very pure and very small and very tightly designed. But because that's hard, that's like a hard sell to like buy something that's just that, there's like, there's four of them. Um, so yeah, like you were saying, if you do sort of get stuck into a rut with one of them you can just switch to a different sport for a while and try your hand at that <laughs> so is this type of game um, obviously your last game was very different is this something that you've always really enjoyed playing so you're like oh I want to make one of these or uh, what was sort of the idea behind uh, going towards this sort of like multiplayer party focus yeah so one of my favourite games of all time is Samurai Gun which I think is like a really underappreciated game. Samurai Gun 2 is coming out to Switch as well, probably about when I'm launching this, so I guess rip me. But um, yeah, like, I, I love these sort of games, and I, I also love Smash Brothers. Like, I have a weekly Smash Brothers night at my house. Actually, for wrestling, uh, a bunch of the levels, when I was doing a lot of prototyping, I'd make a bunch of levels in the Super Smash Brothers stage editor to, um, uh, to, to prototype out levels that I wanted to put in this game. Um, because... It, it's harder to get testers for your own game, but everyone would play my weird Smash Bros. custom so I could like do a bunch of balancing on the Smash levels and then sort of port them over. Um, yeah, so, so I love games like that as well. Um, even more than that, I really love like small, really tight game jam games. Um, it's just unfortunate that I feel like a lot of them just aren't substantial enough to justify a full commercial release. And that's part of what inspired this as well, where I wanted to build a little platform where I could put a couple of those together and make those like those smaller, really tight experiences that don't feel like they need to add in a whole bunch of prop to become sellable, you know? Yeah. So some of these concepts were game jams that got put together, right? Yeah, so um, the fencing game that was inspired by Nidhogg is actually inspired by the first Nidhogg trailer. Uh, a friend of mine and I had a game jam on like that weekend. We were so excited by the trailer, we wanted to play it. Uh, so we decided to just prototype it out in the game jam. Uh, and we got loads wrong about how it actually worked. And a lot changed from that trailer before Nintox release. And I think a lot of the, the like errors, quotes, errors we made in developing our little prototype resulted in a very different game. The one that I really liked. And that was the inspiration to turn into fencing. Um, yeah, another game jam that a friend of mine made called Volley Blockers eventually turned into volleyball. Um, 
Yeah, I really love uh, Samurai World Smash Ball, which is like a sort of obscure Japanese arcade game that, that turned into Smash Ball in this. So, yeah, lots of inspiration from those smaller games. Awesome. Um, I guess just going back to, you said you tested sort of concepts in the Smash Bros. Um, editor. I'm wondering, like, um, like for example, like wrestling, how would you test or whatever mode you sort of um, tested in that um, game? How, how did you go about doing that? I'm sort of curious. Um, well, as for the stages, so, so for testing wrestling, for testing all the sports, it's a long and slow process of iteration where you'll, uh, you'll add in all your key features and then you just change the numbers over a course of months and months to try and find something that feels really tight and responsive and it feels right. Changing a small thing, like the timing of like how long it takes you to get up from when you land from the dive, has big consequences because everything's in like a delicate balance where it needs to be quick enough that it doesn't feel like you're locked down there forever and you're helpless but it needs to be long enough that you can punish someone that makes a mistake. Um, so a lot of that was just a process of trying something out, seeing how it felt, uh, going back to it and trying something different. And then past that, it was about finding the gaps and the tiny little input interactions that were important. Like once we added levels that you could slide off of the side of onto the bottom, we found that if you dived and you were just on the edge, when you stood up, you'd stand up right in the middle and immediately fall to your death, and that felt really bad. So we added in a little thing where you could hold the directional stick and it would get you up to that side, so you could survive on those. And those little details, I think, really help it feel more deliberate. You don't feel robbed by the game. Um, and there's so much that goes into that, and that takes a really long time, but I think it's definitely worth it. Like with, with the wrestling, a, lo a lot of the moments where everyone just like bursts into laughter is like someone goes for the slam, just misses like no, then like then the other person yeah. just crushes down and is like damn it, and like <laughs> smacking their chairs and yeah, um like uh, you're a, a fellow, uh, well not fellow, I'm not a game developer, but you're from Adelaide, you're a game developer there. What's sort what's sort of the, uh, the I guess the scene like there for developing this game and your previous games. I think it's kind of hard to say because I've only ever lived and developed games in Adelaide. Uh, being in Melbourne at the moment, it's kind of overwhelming seeing you know the facilities and resources and like the the number of studios that are here. So it's a weird question because I feel like like I'm here and seeing all the studios and everything that's going on in Melbourne. I'm like, wow, this seems way better. But I love making games in Adelaide and I love Adelaide. Um, so I, I think it's great. Uh, I mean, partially that's just because I have a lot of really great friends in the game dev scene there. Like, I work I work down the hole from Team Cherry, right? It rules. Um, and, uh, like, so I think it's great developing there. But, you know, seeing this as well, it's really cool. And it's, it's hard for me to say if it's good or not because it's the only one I know. Because, yeah, because when I come here, it's like, it's always... I've been coming here for five years or something, but it's, it's always overwhelming because I'm from a country town in South Australia. So even going to Adelaide and seeing uh, Avcon, it's like, oh, there's a lot of people here, oh, <laughs> sort yeah. of thing. But it's, yeah, it's great seeing an Avcon where it's just like a real nice, tight-knit community. And, you know, I'm not a part of it, but I love going there like, to see You're the... Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm not a, you know, a developer. But when, when, I, when I go to, um, you know, test everyone's games, that's really cool. And everyone's like really embraces one another and everything. And, yeah, hopefully it's the same here. I, I assume it is. Yeah, I mean, it's so great, like, being able to talk to all the developers in their booths at, like, something like PAX and things as well. I think... That's why, that's why the indie sections in these conventions are always my favourite. Like, it's nice being able to just see a game and play it and then talk to the people that, like, made it. I think that's really special. Um, so, yeah, like, I, I love the indie sections in here. And I think Avcon's got a really great example of that. And PAX has still got it, even though it's so big. Well, um, I won't waste too much of your time. Thank you very much for joining me today, Matt. Uh, if people want to check out um, you know, what this game's all about, what the website, the Twitter and all that, where can they go and find it and when can they get their hands on it? Uh, so you can look up WrestleDunk Sports. That'll have like all the media kit and you can follow our Twitter accounts and everything. If you want to see what I'm up to, um, at Oran, O-R-A-N-N on Twitter. Um, we don't have a release date yet and we're only confirmed for Switch, but it'll maybe come to other platforms and we're looking at sometime late this year, early next year, around that sort of area. But we're not going to commit to any dates yet. Pay attention to the Twitter account. They'll yep. find it out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me, and I'll catch you later. And Bryce, we're back. Just cut my try and transition out because you don't like it. Yeah, well, I'll probably <laughs> cut them all out, throw them all in the bin. No, oh, that's not nice. No. no. So I guess just to the, the wrap it up, Bryce, since... Uh, 
our original audio um, is in the ether somewhere. Yep. D- did you enjoy PAX, my friend? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if it would have caught the uh, audio from when we were talking about it, but I enjoyed last year's more. But I think I had more. To it be... didn't. No, it didn't. No. <laughs> I think I enjoyed last year's more, but that's only because there was more more for me to be excited about last year. I did a lot this year, and you know, I went and played Final Fantasy, uh, both. You know, seven re- seven remake and fourteen got my got my fourteen shirt. I'm very proud of myself. Um, and you know, I, I played Call of Duty and I played Destroy All Humans, and, and you know, I had fun. I I lined up for more games this year, which is you know probably part of the reason I was kind of <laughs> frustrated <laughs> and yeah. uh, less enthused. But um, I definitely had fun, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I'm sure you'll hear about it on Cracking Furfies when that goes up. Mm. Well, I I really enjoyed it this year, but like last year, I was so excited for Smash Bros. Yeah, getting to play and that, that. Was the thing. Yeah, and like this year, <clears throat> I could have like I could have played or I could have left Pokemon. I don't have to play Pokemon before it comes out. No, like if it was like this is a demo where you're exploring the wild area or you're exploring this town or etc cetera, etc. Cetera, I'll be like, yes, give me that demo. But all it was was going for the water gym, challenging Nessa with preset Pokemon. Um, the same you you probably would have watched if you watched the demo from E3, which, That's I, right. which I did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you get to see Impidimp, which hasn't been announced yet, so good on you, I guess. But yeah, uh, so yeah, Pokemon probably was my highlight because that is the game I'm most amped for. But at the same time, the demo didn't really oh yeah do like, much for me. So it didn't like, push any buttons. It was just Pokemon. I just like I got the player. Yeah, can't yay, wait. Pokemon. Can't got, wait got to me play a it. Thobble pin. Yay. Yeah, I got my Grookey pin beautiful yeah because okay. um we were in line with uh, Shree from explosion network and she was going to get school bunny you're obviously going to get uh sobble and i'm like well might as well get grookey you know even it out so we're not getting doubles yeah that's right uh, and i am thinking now like oh i might actually get like actually choose grookey um unless they announce the starters or the evolutions and i'm like ah oh, that looks like rubbish i actually really hope they don't because i just want the mystery I just want to choose them for face value and choose them. Go ahead. I'm picking Sobble no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> you can go right ahead. I'm just going grass because I want the type advantage, you bastard. I'm going to take you down, you sad you don't, tadpole. You don't know if I've got a second typing yet, mate. Oh, shit. Oh, no. It could be water flying. You could be. Know. could be water rock. Could You'll be, be fucked. Rock. could be water rock. Mm. I don't think it will be, though, because we kind of have one already. So. Yeah. You know, just we've already, we've got a lot of firefighting, and look at School Bunny. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know, don't don't go in with that uh, thing. You know, Game Freak like to not mix it up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Pax was a lot of fun. Shame about uh, our troubles with the Audio Technica booth um, and all that, but it is here what we've managed to salvage. Yes. Yeah. So Bryce, let's move into some of the news. So. Th- a few of them will be a bit quicker. Some of them will not be that quick. Yep. Um, so you're a big Persona 5 fan. I and am. And a trailer yep. came out for Persona 5 Scramble, the Phantom Strikers, and it's coming out in 2020. You're a big uh, fan of like these sort of Musa games. Musa, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Are, are you going to get this on Switch or PlayStation or whatever? Or will you think... Oh, I'll pick it up eventually on Switch. Yeah. I, th- I think at the end of the day, the thing is, is, it's still Persona. I might be a little bit miffed that it's not just Persona on Switch. Uh, but um, I like Musou games and I like Persona, so I guess I'll uh, probably give it a crack. Um, I've already got three or four of them. It's not like I need another one, but, you know, I'll buy it anyway. Mm. Sometimes yeah. it's just like mindless fun, and I mean, that's what Musou games are. They're mindless fun. Looking through the uh, trailer, it looks like the style was 110% to come through <laughs> yeah. for this game as well, so yeah. that's awesome to see. Oh, yeah, well, that's the thing is... Uh, Kawaii Tecmo is good at that. Um, yeah. Like, holding holding true to the sort of style of uh, what something is. And, I mean, like, that that's true for most of the shit they do, including um, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Like, they've, mm. they've still managed to uphold, uh, you know, even though they were only... They, it wasn't obviously just uh, their IP or anything, but um, they did majority of the work. They made up majority of the workforce with a lo- along with some of ISIS... Uh, yeah, that sounds 
terrible, but intelligent systems, everybody. It sounds like ISIS. Yeah, anyway. I was about to say, like, we, where are we going with this? I S Y S, okay, not I S I S. ISIS. ISIS. ISIS, my favourite game developer. That's exactly right. Uh, anyway, um, it was mostly comprised of Koei Tecmo, and they did a brilliant job at making a 10 out of 10 Fire Emblem game, as you can read at my uh, on my review at dashgamer.com. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I have faith in them to make a good-themed Muso game. They did it with Hyrule Warriors. They did it with Fire Emblem. Done. Mm, yeah. I uh, probably won't pick this up. I need to play Persona 5 before. And as far as spin-off games for Persona 5 go, I want to. I still haven't played the uh, the Rhythm one you let me borrow on PlayStation yet either. Yeah, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm like sitting there. I'm like, yeah, man, take it. Hopefully get you to play the actual game. <laughs> and you haven't even touched it yet. <laughs> no, no. Fuck my life. Yeah, fuck your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so next up Bryce uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 has received scores from Famitsu beautiful so everyone's pretty familiar with how Famitsu review scores work they get um, four separate review scores from separate people in the, from the magazine so it, re- it received a 9 and 3 eights, which uh, adds up to be 33 out of 40 so not too bad I guess it's I guess if you're looking for like a bit of a grade it's like a a B yeah a B yeah and I think to be honest that that's what I was expecting for Luigi's Mansion 3 I'm not looking for like the most revolutionary epic well put together story and gameplay and everything from what I played at PAX it's fun it was a lot of fun yeah just like um, <laughs> sorry continue on I'll talk about it in a minute pick, picking up the controls once like you know the five minutes or three minutes whatever it took to like work out how to do the plunger how to suck it up how to rip it off I'm like alright this can be fun the mechanics are good so it's what I expected and some people were like oh there was articles framing this as if it was like bad review scores oh and it's not no and it's just like um, no yeah it's like this This is fine this is good this is for Mitsu yeah and it got an a 8 and 8 and 8 and a 9 is good yeah you know that it doesn't look so impressive on paper when you when you see 33 out of 40 mm. feels like it's dropped a lot more than just 8, 8, 8 and 9 but it is still 8, 8, 8, and 9. That's still good. Someone gave it a 9 out of 10. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm look, I'm look, really looking forward to Luigi's Mansion 3. Oh, me too. Comes out uh, yeah, next week or this week when the podcast is up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, should it be good? Um, There was one thing. What? So What, mate? People were already uh, uploading shit about it, uh, you know, about a, about a week ago. And um, there was one video that was just absolutely entrancing. I think I've watched it a hundred times. And it is oh, the, simply, yeah. it is simply just Mario and Luigi saying goodnight to Princess Peach and each other before they go to bed. Yeah. Night night. <laughs> and it's just so it's just so mesmerizing to watch because like you kind of just don't expect like the facial animation quality. Yeah. That sort of comes out of it. It's really good. It's like, okay, night night. <laughs> and you're just like Holy shit. <laughs> You're just sitting there like holding your switch just like with your headphones like, what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> night, night. That, that is what I go to sleep to is Luigi telling me night, night. Night, night. Night, night. <laughs> it's like, look at my, look at how Mario and Luigi say goodnight to each other. It's like, night, night. Night, night. <laughs> <laughs> Did that really well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> so this is uh, something for everyone who does not live in Japan to be jealous about Japan. Ooh. So there's a, a Nintendo Tokyo store to be opened um, in Japan or in Tokyo, obviously. Surprise, there is one already. Yeah, exactly. On uh, the 22nd of November. So it's going to be the first uh, Nintendo store to be opened in Japan, which is crazy because it's obviously like... It's a, a Japanese company. <laughs> a Japanese company. They've got uh, Nintendo New York, which is like a huge store oh, over yeah. in the States. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's going to be located on the sixth floor of Shibuya uh, Shopping Center. Uh, there will be a new Pokemon Center opening at the same venue, which will also collaborate with Nintendo, Nintendo Tokyo. Here are some of the items that will be available, and it just shows off like uh, T-shirts, let's say Nintendo Tokyo. There's uh, bags, stickers, keychains, just like little knickknacks and things like that. Not Nothing like really to ride home about, like, you know, there's not like a big 
statue or something really cool like that to yeah. buy. But it's like yeah. a nice little knickknacks. If I went to, to Japan, I'd probably like waste a lot of money in like the Pokemon Center. And, Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. If I ever go to New York, of course I'm going to go to the really <laughs> Nintendo we're store. We're really going to plan that trip to Japan, by the way. Yeah, that'd be cool. Oh, we, yeah. We'll have to go here. I really want to go to a Pokemon Center and just like buy stuff. <laughs> I, th- I think that's what I'm going to do. Is like, uh, if, if I get this job offer that's coming up this year, I think I'm going to start saving. We'll go for a trip to Japan. I reckon this sounds like a good idea. It does sound like a good idea. Should do it. Yeah, mm. for sure. We'll go in the Nintendo store. We'll talk about it then. And the Pokemon Centers. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, What would you buy from the, uh, the Pokemon Center? I don't know. I would just... Uh, probably just play my cards till i get there that's the thing is like well, especially with all the specialty stores like they they're always like check out all this stuff that you can buy at the pokemon center but until you actually get there and have a look at it you don't know exactly what's going to be there and readily, readily available so mm. i'll just hold my cards i won't get too excited <laughs> i do want to go to um they do have uh three eorzea cafes yeah for final fantasy 14 as well one's themed as the uh the forest starting city once oh, really? the desert wow. starting city and once themed after the sea starting city mm. and apparently they're really good uh the friend that i caught up with at pax um she's been there and been to two of them yeah and she said they're brilliant so we'll have yeah. to go have a look at that too well this uh, new pokemon center that they're opening they were showing the plans like back when they announced it and i think it was actually during the event when they announced like pokemon home and stuff actually you know i'm thinking about it and they shown like mewtwo in like the the cryo chamber and stuff like that they've got like that just in the store just as wicked yeah yeah and like it looks really cool like i think they're trying to actually make this store not look so much like a store very thematic yeah yeah which is cool like that's why i want to go to the cafe or um because they are they're really thematic and they look really awesome Mm. so yeah keen so next up there was an interview with time uh, with a Nintendo president uh, Shantaro uh, Farukawa Furukawa Farukawa Furukawa yes um, and he had some uh, interesting quotes in the interview the interview um, I'll put it in the show notes so you can uh, go and read the thing for yourself but there weren't a whole lot of quotes necessarily it was just like a lot of con- lot of like information about like oh the switch is selling well and this is what's going on since the wii u we didn't sell too well it's like yes yes i know that i know that yeah but uh they said a few things so he he talked about uh nintendo's freedom to uh, create new ip uh what they're doing with mobile uh monetization and uh a little bit of a comparison to disney as far as how they're going to handle their ip and their properties so as far as uh nintendo's freedom to create uh new ips and that he says, Nintendo is Nintendo because of our games, our characters, and IP. So giving teams the freedom to experiment with new ideas is something I strongly agree with. Expansion can't happen without the freedom to try something new. It's a very good thought. Yeah. And the courage to step into unfamiliar territory. And like we see like some of these things like you know Labo, which is really out there, Ring Fit Adventure, which is sort of trying to ride off of the success of um, you We know, Fit and all that. We Fit in that, but yeah, it's but sort of fitting more towards actual yeah. gamers. And it's not something just... something very different. Yeah, as well. Yeah, something very um, expensive too. <laughs> yeah. Watch uh, watch watch uh, Eric's video on it. Mm. I like to be honest, watching uh, Eric's um, Nintendo by Numbers coverage of that game, like he's doing. He's starting a hashtag. He's doing a, a weekly video reporting on how he's going and getting like sort of the community on his side involved in that. I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't Good mind on. giving that a go. That Good looks on like you, Eric. Yeah. yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Well done. Yeah, and it, it's things like that as well as like you know they had like a huge success with Splatoon because they let their developers like go out and try something new. Yeah. If it was up to a uh, Miyamoto, he would like he didn't like the idea of Splatoon like when it was initially brought up to him. So it's good getting new people with new ideas and um, need yeah. to break out of the old fashioned. Yeah, because as much as we love Zelda and Mario, like we, it can't be the only thing they do. No. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's why the Wii U was good too, though. Like I, I feel like as much as shit as it uh, as it gets, it was sort of like the first time uh, IPs come out and everybody's just been like, bam, that is, and it's just blown up. Mm. Uh, yeah, like a few things from like Platinum and Splatoon and you know all of that that's that's when that started happening so you know discredit all the Wii U all you want at least during that time the software was good I like the software on that console yeah but anyway um, and they he talks about this is a quote as uh, for the 
uh, mobile monetization. He says, in terms of monetization, that's something we decided on uh, an app basis. It's something we decided looking at the game content of each app as well as the IP used uh, the IP used and the player that we're targeting. We also look at how we can best have the player enjoy the game as well as how they would be comfortable in spending money. So I was like, obviously, like what we've seen in the last uh, few releases was they're like, they're comfortable spending money on gacha <laughs> loot boxes. Yeah. Because that's what they're sort of you know, resorted to. Um, Pokemon Company came came to that realization by themselves, I assume. And Mario Kart Tour, they've come to that realization. Mario Kart Tour can suck my left nut. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Nintendo. It's it's no go. Waste of time. Yeah, put it in the bin. Put it in the bin. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the last the last quote, just talking about IP and um, the uh, the interviewee sort of uh, well, the interviewer sorry asked him sort of like oh comparing to Disney of how they sort of handled their IP. So Farukawa says, a company... Oh, sorry. This isn't the quote here. This is how the article reads. A company built around the adored intellectual property that's in theme parks, movies, and merch business. That sounds a whole lot like Disney and the um, MA-obsessed pop culture behemoth that under uh, CEO Bob Iger has uh, gobbled up everything from Star Wars to Marvel. Asked, asked if the <laughs> mouse house is a model for Nintendo's f- future, Farakawa doesn't buy it. He says, We never tried to uh, imitate any other company, he says, later adding that the idea of using IP in things like theme parks or movies is simply an, expe- uh, an ex- uh, extension of philosophy we've had for a long time. Um, but it's not really, because it wasn't until like a few years ago they they decided to like really branch out. Yeah, it was when right. it was when Awada was in control and the Wii U wasn't looking too great, and they've got to sort of leverage their IP to stay relevant and stay ahead. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a, philo- a philosophy they've had for a long time, because they're only starting doing it now. So yeah, that's right. They might have had the philosophy, but they're also not. They haven't been um, reaching out to do it. No, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. No. Uh, Nah, <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just interesting, like coming from him. It's like you know, he he's been there for a long time, and he's he he actually worked at um, Nintendo Germany for a while as well. So that it's all interesting, and yeah. So if you want to read the full article, it's linked in the the show notes. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, so next up, Bryce is Nintendo Switch. It it's uh, sold fifteen million in. North America, beautiful. So you know that is a a lot of systems. Um, oh, what are we looking at? Here? Sorry, guys. Uh, so Nintendo Switch and Nintendo Switch Lite systems have uh, combined to sell over 15 million units in North America since the launch of the flagship Nintendo Switch system in March 2017, according to intellectual data from Nintendo. Uh, though September. Nintendo Switch sales in North America were up more than 20% year to date. Uh, in the US alone, Nintendo Switch has been the best selling video game console for 10 months in a row, according to MPD Group, which tracks video game sales in the United States. So, yeah, it's a. I think we're reading a lot of these stories. Like, oh, Switch is selling very well. <laughs> good, that is good. It's like, yes. <laughs> Don't think we need to talk too much about it, any. Yeah. So it's just like it's just interesting when because we see like the sales like oh it sold like thirty five million worldwide but it's interesting to break it down to like just the United States and just Japan yeah and we'll never get it for Australia because it's so small yeah but yeah it's just it, it's also inter- interesting because we assume last we know of the Switch has sold about thirty five million and it's interesting that fifteen million of that is in. North America alone. Yeah, yeah. Which isn't a surprise. It's a huge market. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, pretty uh, pretty crazy, but, you know, a little bit under half of just all Switches are in America. That's right, yeah. That is right. That is right. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> all right, Bryce, that's... Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's factually correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> I don't know why I'm thanking you for that, but... So, Bryce, let's move on to a little bit of Pokemon talk. Um, for the last two weeks, since we've uh, been on hiatus, 
Um, a lot of Pokemon stuff's come out. We're not going to touch on all of it. We're not going to like sit here and talk about it. What do you think of uh, Galarian Ponytar, Bros? Um, it's very cute. Looking forward to getting it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's pretty pretty basic stuff. Yep. And also, there's been new Gigantamax forms for Pikachu, Eevee, uh, Meowth, and Butterfree. Meowth and Butterfree. Yeah. And Charizard. Mm. I do want to talk about the Pikachu. <laughs> I, I, I love Pikachu. the Pikachu. He's a big and, chonker. And I watched it on my phone with no sound initially. Like, oh, that's great. You know, old fashioned Pikachu from the anime, the one. Big old chonker. Yeah, big old chonky Pikachu. But when it, <laughs> when I had the sound, I was like, Pikachu. Oh my god, that is, <laughs> that is brilliant. It's actually beautiful. Uh, <laughs> just, just it was a good laugh. Yeah. Pikachu. So, um, I guess I just, I just really want to talk about. You know, we're we're a month away from Pokemon Sword and Shield. Uh, it's it's probably the uh, the biggest game coming to Switch in 2019. Do you think I'm wrong in saying that? Or yes. You are absolutely wrong that okay. the okay. the the giant <laughs> the, the, be- the behemoth the giant monster that it is Pokemon is not going to be the biggest release on the Switch this year. Yeah. Alright, don't eat the sarcasm, mate. <laughs> Alright, don't you don't you step out of line, co host. It'll probably get pretty close to being the highest selling game on Switch by the time it's done selling in the first two weeks. It'll be interesting to see, yeah, if it can if it can, like go past Smash, go past I think it will go past Let's Go. Oh, Let's yeah. go seeing about ten million. Yeah, yeah. It would be it would be pretty cool to like compare them, see if uh, hardcore fans were turned off by the Let's Go series. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't think they were. I think this will, you know, do perfectly well being the brand new Pokemon. Mm. Actually, uh, was it yesterday? I pre-ordered my steel book. I was going to pre-order it on uh, EB Games, but EB Games it must have sold out or something. So I went to JB Hi-Fi um, online, pre-ordered my steel copy um, and it says it's going to be anywhere from two to six days after release but I am just I'm going to download it anyway yep um, so who cares <laughs> yeah because obviously I'm like that sucks if like this is you know if you're not obsessed like I am and you're just buying the physical copy yeah yeah it's a bit it's a bit rough but especially when you don't have a JB Hi-Fi here and you can't just go and get it that's exactly right that's exactly right. Thanks. You say I'm right a lot here, Bryce. You're just trying to butter me up, aren't you? Yeah. You're right. treating me like a little bit of a jam cupcake, and you're just going to butter me up and you're going to eat me after the podcast. Jam fucking cupcake. Yeah. Jam cupcake. Beautiful. Put some butter on that jam cupcake. Mm. What type of jam am I, Bryce? Blueberry. Blueberry jam. I'm a bit of a raspberry man, actually. Yeah. Uh. I think it tastes like blue, 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 blue. So, um, I want to I want to talk about the Pokemon Sword and Shield uh, ad that came out, which sort of uh, brought like you know it went from Gen One to Gen Eight, and it brought it all together. Have you have you seen it? No. <laughs> How Bob? Oh, Jesus. For somebody that for somebody that wants to go in that game as fresh as possible, you're certainly watching a lot of shit on. <laughs> no shit. Do a Nintendo podcast, Bryce. We do. We do do a Nintendo oh, podcast. No. We do. <laughs> But no, I didn't watch it because well, it's got no spoilers in it, Bryce. So I, I'm completely out of the loop when it comes to that shit because at this point with Pokemon, I'm like, hey, Pokemon's going to come out very soon. I don't think I need to know anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, I need to know, and the, basically, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Gotcha. Um, the trailer it goes through like Gen One. There's like um Gen One uh, Pikachu sprite in the forest, like a real life forest, and then it goes to Gen Two, same thing. All these Pokemon running. It goes through Gen Three, uh, Gen Four, Gen Five, Gen Six, Gen Seven, and like it all accumulates into like this one area. Then um these people hold up their Game Boys and Game Boy Advances, and they then they just like turn the switches. Then all the Pokemon change from like their sprites and th- 3D models and all different things into like the 3D models from Sword and Shield, and it's it's actually a really like nostalgic and pretty cool trailer. So so it's nostalgia bait, gotcha. Yes, beautiful. Pokemon's good at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not gonna get me with that mouse trap. <laughs> oh, not that mouse trap. They're trying to get you there, Bryce. No, that that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to be like, remember all these Pokemon that you used to catch? It's like, well, you could catch them in this new game. You haven't played the games for a long time, but you did play with the sprites, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, if, you pick up, if you pick up a Switch and a po- copy of Pokemon Sword Shield, you could catch them all. And they're like, oh, awesome. I'm going to catch all my favorite Pokemon, which happen to be the only first 151 Pokemon. I don't want any more. And, and then it's like, right. they're not there. Right. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah. Look, nostalgia bait, mate. That's how they do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess going on from nostalgia bait, uh, when uh, Galarian forms were first oh, announced, beautiful. we saw Zigzagoon, um, and, uh, you know, they they got their own forms and they got a new evolution, Obstagoon. We're like, oh, great. Not just Kanto Pokemon are getting new forms. And, <laughs> and since then, it's been nothing but the original <laughs> Kanto Pokemon getting forms. And Literally I, two Pokemon. And I just want to put the question out there. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking when the Pokemon company and the marketing team are you know, making these trailers to drum up hype, are they just picking out the original Pokemon to reveal? And there's still plenty of uh, you know, Gen 2 onward Pokemon that are getting new forms I fucking doubt it or do you think it is just like no we're pretty much majority just Kanto Pokemon I getting new forms I am 100% convinced that convinced. it's that it's 95% Kanto it was the same well obviously they said in they're like this okay Oh right, their, right. Reset, their, ex- reset. their explanation for it in Sun and Moon was, oh, Alola's really close to Kanto, so you see, it only makes sense. So that that made sense. That was fine. But f- as far as I understand, Galara is nowhere near Kanto. So why? A couple of k's, bit of a boat trip. Well, I reckon it's really far, and that's why it's really hard to trade and see all these Pokemon that they can't <laughs> see around the world. That was another excuse in the law that they're trying to make. So, why is it still all Kanto for the most part? That mm-hmm. I don't know because because uh, Kanto for the most part sells. I uh... I thought it was very brilliant that they were stepping in the right direction and going, "Hey, here's a Zigzagoon and a Lunu and a Lunoon or Obst- whatever, whatever the hell it is, Obstagoon, yeah." Zigzagoon, Obstagoon, all that. I thought, hey, that's brilliant. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, That's brilliant. They're actually representing a different generation of Pokemon with these forms. <laughs> it's, it was bait. So, so going <laughs> it in... Was, it was bait. So going into this, are you keen for the game or... Are you? I'm keen for the game. I just feel like... I don't know. When, when it feels like they're going to break they're going to break a pattern that they're stuck that they've just stuck with for a long time they don't and it's kind of annoying I guess Sun and Moon did it with the Lolan forms I like the Lolan forms they were great yeah yeah but there was only Kanto and then they kind of tried to put a law reason in there it's like oh yeah that's understandable but now like every Gal- Galarian form we're seeing except for one is mm. Kanto well this is our second uh, time of seeing alternate forms so like it would be nice to see more variety in sort of the reach of generation. Baiting. Gen 1. Mm. But, uh, yeah, to be fair, like, um, what they have shown does look pretty pretty neat. I'm not saying it looks yeah. bad. Yeah. I'm just saying that, yeah, I, I feel like the, the, the spice of life's variety and there is none. Mm. <laughs> there is none. And we'll also, we'll, a, a week or so ago, we were talking about that, uh, um, you know... We're going back to the Gigantamax forms, that you know, um, if you play Let's Go Pikachu, you get the Pikachu. Um, if you play Let's Go Eevee, you get the the Eevee, and also with the the Meowth, you get Meowth. If you uh, play the cat, yeah, if you like log on online between release date and January, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, and you felt you felt that was a bit uh, predatory. Is that how you felt? I think. Well, yeah. I don't know. Predatory in a way. Like, the way I was trying to explain it, I guess, is that at the end of the day, if you want that Let's Go Pikachu, Let's Go Eevee exclusive, you're going to have to have a save file on it. So if you don't know anybody that knows, well, that has Let's Go Pikachu, Let's Go Eevee, which, let's be real, there are a lot of people that probably aren't going to have that game now because it's relevancy. Um, I got off Google. Uh, it's relevancy... <laughs> when a new Pokemon game comes out that's an actual Pokemon game yeah um, is going to be very slim so it's sort of like do you want a Gigantamax Pikachu it's like yes I want the fat tubby Pikachu it's like alright you have to have a save for Let's Go Pikachu do you know anybody with that game it's like no guess you just have to buy it then it's like cool alright there you go there's some money for them you know because they'll go out and buy the game they'll get their fat Pikachu Right. Mm. They'll play a new game. They might, they might, but they might enjoy it. They might be going, oh, this is trash. What the hell did I buy this for my fat Pikachu? <laughs> so they'll do that and move on. And they'll do the same thing with Eevee and then with uh, Meowth as well. And they did the same thing with Snorlax, but I feel like it 
didn't really bother me as much with the Munchlax because it was just yeah it was Munchlax because it's just like the Munchlax has a special move and it was like equivalent to Payday or something well it was a Snorlium Z and it gave him um something something pancake oh that too yeah pulverizing pancake yeah yeah the same sort of deal there because it's like you did it in a certain amount of time you know it's like you've got to do it within a certain amount of time otherwise you don't get it and I, that's kind of just like again there are people out there that are like I'd love to play Pokemon I obviously can't afford it right now so I won't be getting it so those people that have the unfortunate sort of uh feeling of well the un- the unfortunate thing of not having money at a time whether it be you know that they literally can't afford it or they're unemployed or something like that and they get it down the line they are going to be missing something out of that mm-hmm. and I feel like um, with Sun and Moon they did it with one Pokemon with this they've done it with three and I don't know if that list is going to grow yet like they might be like hey get this exclusive uh, Lickitung Gigantamax <laughs> form if you connect yourself to the Pokemon Home app. They're like, how how much does it grow? Um, I know that a lot of I know that the Pokemon that have been given these forms are mostly non viable and competitive, but maybe Pikachu. Pikachu would be right. Yeah. Pikachu be be right. Pikachu be alright. You could still give him a light ball. That, that, that's the thing that uh, baffles me. So it's like, all right, I'm gonna have this uh, meowth, and like your three turns <laughs> of being Gigantamax are over goes back to a meowth like oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah with Pikachu it's like hey it's still Pikachu and if you put a light ball on it it's still a force to be reckoned with yeah yeah you know Ho- hopefully the light ball works the same in uh, these games I'm so, sure I'm sure yeah. it will mm. I'm sure it will yeah. it's like you said the other day it's just like oh I can't wait to see the game where they don't put a Pikachu in it yeah it doesn't exist that was <laughs> sarcasm it, yes. exactly it doesn't exist <laughs> doesn't yeah. exist it'll always happen yeah because I feel like we're we're um, on two different mindsets with this because like to, like to be honest the pre-order and uh, owning the other games incentive does not bother me at all no it doesn't but it's it's bound to bother somebody you know I don't really give a shit because I'm going to have them anyway and that doesn't mean it can't just be like oh hey look they're trying to sink a little bit more money out of let's go in some way because they will they'll sell copies of that game just you can't you can look at it as in like oh that's a Let's try and get whoever didn't buy it to buy it. But also, it's just like, oh, these guys, like people who are Pokemon fans, played these games, and as a bit of a reward, like, here you go in in these games. I don't feel like it's that egregious. Yeah, nah. <laughs> there's always some. There's mm. always these guys. They're companies. They're companies. They don't. They, they are. Oh no, shit. They, they do not. Th- the. The company with the highest market value asset in the world is not going to give a shit about the people underneath them. That's very clear. <laughs> it's very fucking clear at this point. Mm. I love Pokemon and I love everything that Pokemon stands for in the most part, but the Pokemon company does not give that much of a shit about you to give you free shit for playing their other game. Sorry, doesn't happen. They're trying to get more money out of it. That's how it is. That's how, bu- that's how business works. That's absolutely yeah. how business works. We complain about Activision and EA all the time. They do the same thing. So, I, like, I, I can't hold a bias for that. Activision does the same thing. Um, if you play Let's Go Pikachu, you can get a Gigantamax <laughs> yeah. Pikachu in Call of Duty. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, the practice is I know, the same. I know, the I practice know. is the same. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to hold a bias for that. So, Bryce, I hate to do this to you, mate. I hate to do this to uh, the listeners as well. Oh, Jesus. But on Nintendo Life, uh, there was an interview with uh, Junichi Masuda. Oh, great. And it's called, the article's called, Negative Feedback Gets uh, gets Us Down But Must Be Taken On Board, says Pokemon's uh, Junichi Masuda. That's it. So, Bryce, this is, uh, this is uh, an interview by Eurogamer. And the, uh, the author at Eurogamer asks, Has some of the negative feedback on the Pokedex, which I'm sorry to dwell on, uh, had much of an impact on moral at Game Freak. I know you have mentioned that you're person you're personally disappointed to not be able to include all the Pokemon. Did you feel? Uh, did the team feel saddened by the reaction at all? And Janucci Masuda says, "Of course, you know, uh, you see these sorts of negative comments, and it does as a developer uh, make you feel a bit down about certain things. But at the same time, you have to take criticism. For example, with Pokemon Let's Go." Early on, there were a lot of comments that it was too easy or that 
uh, it was kind of a bit too kid focused and that sort of thing. That sort of comment is something you see and you take on board and something you really try and base improvements on in the next game on the feedback you received from the last one. So with regards to the Pokedex issue in particular that you've mentioned, it was something that was a really hard decision internally, but there was a lot of discussions about which direction we should take that in, and ultimately we felt that for the overall game, focusing on creating the richest experience we could within the game, leaving the Pokedex as... Uh, we did was the best solution. Uh, Amori also touches upon the issue uh, uh, pleasing all elements of Pokemon fandom. I don't know why he does say pleasing. I don't know. Um, do, do, do you feel like it's quite um, difficult for everyone uh, to please everyone with things like the Pokedex issue recently or some people wanting either a move difficulty or... Um, or welcoming, or a welcoming experience. Sorry, um, was there any difficulty or a pressure there? And Omori answers, "Yeah, there are definitely a level of pressure when you make in a game, but it doesn't make developing a game feel stressful or anything like that. At the end of the day, it's something that we love doing and is a really is really fun to do. But we definitely really want to answer all the wishes of our fans." and live up to their expectations, which is something that's quite challenging. So, in that sense, yeah, it's definitely pressure, but we also, also within ourselves, we always strive to make the best game and really deliver something that we're proud of and that we feel fans are really going to enjoy. So, yeah, there's fun and a pressure in there. And that is end of the quote. So, uh, you know, I, I just thought that was interesting because that is someone directly asking, like, how does, this, how does this affect you guys and whatever? Like, we've, we've heard the reasons um, of why the Pokemon are not going to be the National Dex. This is going to be... I guess this is just ta- touching on the National Dex uh, thing again because it was a while ago since we talked about it and going into sort of the last month of these games before release, um, how we're sort of going to... Uh, I guess playing through it, how we're going to form our opinions on whether... The lack of the national decks was maybe the right, like the right choice, even though it sucks that yeah. a few of our Pokemon are going to be missing. Because I guess this is this is the way I look at it. Um, Pokemon Black and White, you know, great games, playing through them, great story. You you could see that they just felt like effort and love were put into them. Um, Pokemon um, X and Y, when the hype was really there, uh, just because they were the first three D games and everything, and playing through them, I had fun. But there was just... It didn't feel like that same love was there. Mm. And also, the introduction of the 3D models, you could sort of tell that um, that took away from time for other things, such as, like, there was, like, literally no post-game. Yeah. Literally none. Like, I, I, I wanted to keep playing it, but I couldn't. Yeah. Because there was, there was Cause nothing. nothing. Yeah. There was nothing to do. And uh, Sun and Moon's, like, in a similar boat. So, and we, we talk about post-game all the time as far as Pokemon games go, because I want to spend as long as possible in that world. I love training Pokemon. And I guess the way I'm looking at it on the lead up to release is that if it, it sucks that not all the Pokemon are going to be there because I love the collection aspect. But if uh, these things they say that they want to concentrate on are there, if we're getting the post game, um, if we're getting, um, you know, good ways to level up Pokemon and like really do our teams and like in the past the competitive Pokemon scene's always been centered around a certain few Pokemon if they can scale back the Pokedex but have the Pokemon that are there more useful so you know you might have a, it might not it won't be all the Pokemon it won't be all say 600 500 Pokemon that you're going to be using and they're all going to be equal but there might be a pool of 200 Pokemon instead of 50 which might be beneficial so yeah. That's that's what I'm hoping because that you know that's best case scenario. The Pokemon aren't there, but it's More going to be useful. a fantastic game because they could put their time towards this. Yeah, and if uh, if that stuff isn't there and the national decks is well, it is missing, then it's going to be like, all right. You know, it was just a shortcut because I I know it sounds bad saying they've been taking shortcuts, but uh, they've been quoted in the past for taking shortcuts 
Yeah, they have. And yeah, I was talking right. to I was talking to you about this the other day. Like, you know, Pokemon Emerald in Gen Gen Three, one of the best features they introduced in that generation was the Battle Frontier. That was great for post games, great for competitive. It's just a great challenge. Um, it was a fun area to be in. And in the uh, Gen Three remakes, Alpha um, Alpha Al- Sapphire, Alpha Omega, Sapphire Ruby. Omega Ruby. I always get caught up on those names. <laughs> um, it wasn't there. Yeah, it just it it wasn't it wasn't there. And there was a model, <laughs> and there was a quote from Omori saying that you know people are content with short experiences mobile games, so he didn't feel the need to put it in there. <laughs> and I was watching through the Pokemon anime, and I'm like, back in 2000 and I can't remember, say 2008, can't remember what year it was exactly, but there was an a season of the Pokemon anime based around the Battle Frontier. Yeah. The Battle Frontier back then was a big deal. So not to include it in these remakes was just ridiculous. And that was nothing but a shortcut. No, it was absolutely a shortcut. It was a lame excuse for a shortcut too. Man. So just like, you know, stuff like that, I hope will not be missing from the next generation of Pokemon. And hopefully they can concentrate on that because of the missing Pokemon. Yeah. So that's what I've got to say. Bryce, what about yourself? (laughs) Look, at the end of the day... They can they'll, they'll take the criticism. They won't look at it um, as well. That sucks. This person said there's not. They're not going to buy it. <laughs> Guess we're doing the wrong thing. That's not what's going to happen. It will be interesting to see what their take is for the next games now. Well, the thing is, it's like I I I understand, right? I understand that like it's development time, it's development cost. They've got a small team. We listened to a whole. Um, a whole podcast that was like three hours long. Yeah, it was the Game Informer, the Game Informer Game coverage. Informer card, yeah, yeah. Um, they went and talked to them. Yeah, they went to Game Freak and they they talked about their experiences over there, talking about interviewing them and seeing what they saw. And they they talked about how the uh, at Game Freak it is very much still an indie culture. Yeah. Even though they're handling one of the biggest games for Nintendo or even the in the industry in general, it's still like a very indie culture and. Um, well, the way they explained it was that they had a, um, they, what was his name? Um, Junichi Masuda. Masuda. Yeah. Wanted to keep everything tight. It's like, okay. And then he's like, he, they said that he explained the tree of like him and then to other people, he wanted everybody to have the same knowledge that he did. I'm like, then you've got a branching problem. If you've got that problem, that's the reason you're not expanding because you need to have you, then you need to have a person for each section you very explicitly tell those four or five people what they need to be telling the team and you make sure those four or five people are doing the thing you want because that is how you do it. Not one person not one person at the top trying to manage 200 people. Mm. That's that's a problem on his own. For some reason, he feels like he has to do that for 200 people. Yeah. And like on, on paper, I'm like, yeah, that, you know, that makes sense what you're saying. But at the same time, you know, he's he's been directing the Pokemon series for... It does not te- matter. For, for 10 plus years you, know, you can't I, I feel like telling developers what they should be doing is just bullshit <laughs> to be honest it could be bullshit but it could also be the truth it could be they're, hard, yeah. they're, they're handling the biggest they've been taking you were just complaining about how they're taking shortcuts for a fucking long time and they've been making excuses for it this is an excuse this is 100, 100% an excuse if he's been doing it for 10 years he should fucking know how to manage large groups of people you can't fucking tell me that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. <laughs> exactly right. He can do it with more than 200 people. He just doesn't want to. Yeah. That's it. And that's why the games have been cut in ways. Uh, the other thing is, is that when they talk about it, they're like, oh, you know, there the had to be sacrifices made for quality. It's like, okay, but we live in the era of post-game updates. <laughs> Post-release updates. So you could be putting them in there and then they're just like, oh, but that'll put everything out of whack and we don't want to do that. And it's the sort of the same recurring excuses of like, hey, look, they're doing it now. That's how it works. There's patch, there's balance updates, there's DLC. That's how it is. It's, that is the current mm. model of gaming. That's how it is. 
I know. I don't think anybody would give a shit if you'd have to buy a literal season pass to get all the Pokemon in that Ooh, one game. Oh, that is that is shit. No, <laughs> it is shit. But if it was fifteen dollars to get the rest of your Pokemon in there, oh no, you can't. Sell. With no, don't sell Pokemon. With what do you fucking mean? Don't sell Pokemon. They make you buy two versions. They don't make you buy it. Well, you okay? Let's say you lived in oh. the middle of butt fuck nowhere, three hundred kilometers away from everyone, and you wanted all the Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? Would you travel 300 kilometers to go meet someone to get the Pokemon out? Or would you just get the fucking copy shipped to you? Just get the copy shipped to me. Exactly right. But I've already played the fucking game because I'm a Pokemon fan and I played the previous game. <laughs> but you've got the two versions now, so you got all your Pokemon, don't you? No, I've just got Pikachu. I couldn't give a shit about Eevee. Fuck Eevee. <laughs> I just want the fat Pikachu. I don't want the fluffy Eevee. Attracts the opposite gender. I'm talking hey, about, okay, 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 but I'm talking about Sword and Shield here. Right, you wanted all the Pokemon, but you had absolutely no access to another way to get them. Then you'd have to have both versions to get it. So you can't say if you live if you live in the middle of like the outback or something, you've got other problems. Or, no. or there's somebody like you, <laughs> or there's somebody like mm. you that like to own everything. I love to own everything. You fucking look at your Pokemon collection. You've got every fucking version except for that Eevee. That's the only thing you don't have. Mm. It's the only thing you don't have. So you can't fucking tell me that they're not trying to sell Pokemon because they've been doing it to you since fucking red, blue, yellow, and onwards. <laughs> so don't fucking tell me that shit. Hey, no I just like the boxes, bros. I like boxes. <laughs> I don't really care about the Pokemon on them, necessarily. I'm not like, oh, I've got to get but this. But you've got them. <laughs> yes. So if like at each base, base retail value, it was like 50, 60 bucks each for red, blue, yellow. That's still $180 that you would have spent on Pokemon if you started buying it from that point. For something you technically have the experience for $60 game for. So you can't tell me they're not trying to sell you out. They've been doing that for years. Mm. I don't see what next extra $15 is going to fucking do to your wallet, to be completely honest. Well, you know, it's just the it's just it, it it's it's cause, the concept because you know you go back to just go back to sun and moon. What what, what if they did the same thing there? Here's the here's fifteen dollars. You get access to the other stuff. It's like what? <laughs> it's the same thing. So ugh. well, that, but they didn't have to. Yeah, <laughs> because they they had all the Pokemon there. So who cares? <laughs> they should put out a video where it's just like, tell you what, no making the models is real hard. Um, so what we're doing we've got Terrence he's on the spare computer on the side um, <laughs> um, it's $15 for the season pass Terrence will uh, gradually get these Pokemon out pay his wages um, we're a small company got to pay Terrence um, yep you know he's, he's an expensive guy modelers uh, modelling artists don't come cheap um, we've got Terrence in he's from he's actually in from Bandai Namco um <laughs> He worked on the Tekken games, but we've got him in because he's actually on his. He's actually on. I fucking cry. He's actually on school holidays. My point is, okay. My point is, is a Pokemon fan will pay to get their hands on fifteen Pokemon. They would pay to get their hands on that. Mm-hmm. Oh, did you see this? an extra fifteen? Pokemon. Did you see the shiny Lunala and uh, Solgaleo? I did. didn't get an EB games. Yeah, I did. And buy those bad boys. But my my point is is mm. you could a person will pay for pay an entire another full price for those extra fifteen Pokemon and nothing more because it is essentially the same game. So you can't tell me that people won't pay an extra fifteen dollars to get another four hundred Pokemon in their game. There is no way <laughs> in hell <laughs> because I look at your collection and I call you a fucking hypocrite for that. I, I just buy them. I don't care about the extra... I'm just saying, I don't care about like, oh, you know... Yeah, but that's even worse. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> probably so is. So don't, <laughs> don't even fucking tell me about that shit. That is absolutely worse. You just want them because they're there. And it's not even the fact that you want the extra Pokemon that are on them. You just want them because they're there. That's even worse. Yeah, so no, you can't you're, fucking tell me yeah, that you're extra right about that. $15. That is worse. Mm. Yeah. So don't even fucking argue that point. An extra fifteen dollars, I am one hundred percent certain a whole bounty of people will well, I, absolutely pay that. I bought Sword and Shield. I was like, oh, I'll get a nice little uh, metal case. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> Same diff. <laughs> yeah, you open up. It's got a map in there. Oh look, there's the Gala region. <laughs> All right, Bryce. I didn't realize. I didn't really think this was going to go so uh, like this, but it, it did. Right. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, just. Uh, 
put it back on track. Looking, we're looking forward to the games. We are. We are. We, we're, we're just very... We're, we're passionate boys about our... Uh, just cynical. <laughs> electric Mouse uh, series. That's right, yeah. That one. Pachirisu is the mascot. Very mm-hmm. nice little uh, little man. Uh, <laughs> Mimikyu. Mimikyu. I like Mimikyu too. There you go. There's a Pokemon Halloween, a Pokemon Go Halloween event going on. You can get a Pikachu Mimikyu. Have fun. Yeah, that that is a uh, that is a bit of inception there. <laughs> Don't know how I feel about that. No, no. Yeah, it's a bit 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 cruel. Mm, I'm like, mm, is it a Mimikyu or is it Pikachu or is it a Mimikyu that is mimicking a Pikachu? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. That's right. I put it next to my Pikachu with a hat, Pikachu with another hat. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. Anyway, Bryce, this has been a very long episode, so we will end it there. Right. Um, yes. Um, hope you, if anyone who listened to the whole thing, thank you very much. I hope we didn't drag on too long. <laughs> oh, fucking. I know some The episode's going to be like two and a half hours long. Christ. No, a bit over two hours, Bros. What, what's the timer out there? Uh, I'm not going to say because once I put everything in, it's going to throw it off and it's going to break the fourth wall. And you can't break the fourth wall. Just of tell a me podcast. what it says on there. Uh, not telling. Just tell no, me what it says a, on there. It's a there. secret. Everybody, thank you very much for listening to the House of Mario episode 119. I'm going to find out. If you <laughs> enjoyed the show, please leave a review on your podcast service of choice. And if you'd like to support us a little bit more, you can support like us from two and a half eight, hours long. <laughs> you can support us from a dollar on Patreon to access our ultimate podcast feed, which is Crack and Furfies, our supplement to this show called the House of Mario Encore. And uh, Secret Recordings, which is a sort of behind-the-scenes talk about uh, whatever, whatever I like, really. That's what, that, that podcast is a sort of a blank slate as far as uh, what I'm going to do with it. I'm looking, yeah. f- looking forward to sort of uh, figuring out what that's going to be. So, Fair enough, mate. Thanks, Fair Bryce. Enough. So, Bryce, if people wanted to hear more of your sh- bullshit... Bullshit? On social media, where you're talking about... Fucking bullshit. You're bloody talking about, Drew, oh, you're a dickhead because you buy, you buy a Pokemon. you got to keep this poor indie studio afloat, bro. <laughs> this fucking poor indie Buddy, studio. Masuda, Masuda here, he, he's, uh, he's, he's very... He's, he's eating his two-minute noodles. He's, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. He's like, Not oh... Not his $300 ramen, no. It's like, oh, you know, I'm, I was composer and producer for that long now. I'm just like the the organiser of like the one of the biggest uh, franchises in the world. And yeah, you know, it's, life's hard. So if they want to hear any of that stuff, Bryce, on social media, being Twitter, where can they find that? Uh, at IV Revan. Thanks, Bryce. Get and my Twitch account back, you fucks. <laughs> what, Twitter? Twitter no, get it back no I'm talking about Twitch you're talking to the audience I said give, got- no I said give my Twitch account back you fucks <laughs> oh I think you're talking to everyone who's listening to this no no I'm gonna say it every episode you know what's gonna happen it's gonna happen now I'm so- gonna create a new Twitch account I'm gonna rise to well above what I was at and then I'm gonna say hey where the fuck's <laughs> my old account <laughs> you're like replace ninja I can't even it's, it's just ridiculous. I can't even install the Twitch app on my phone because you oh. can't fucking watch Twitch unless you log in. Mm. And if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, Shut you can follow me at iDruby and you can Twitch. follow the show at The House of Mario. And Bryce, today's Nintendo jukebox is by Glitch X City. It's a Pokemon Sword and Shield rival battle theme music remix and... I like the I like the uh, rival theme. I'm, I'm one of the things I'm looking forward to actually playing these games is like really listening to all the music because one of my favorite things about Pokemon is the music. So hopefully they uh, do it justice. Hopefully. Anyway, Bryce, I'll see you later, mate. You grumpy bastard. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <ya. laughs>